I think we must try to trace down all these uh, different aspects and elements in the archaeological records and also try to connect all of them uh, together to, to try to achieve at least an overall understanding of the phenomenon. So now, it's really, really possible that I'm slightly biased by the fact that I've dedicated my last five years in studying Bartolitz. But do you want to know uh, which proxy allowed to connect at least all the elements you can see uh, in, in this slide? Well, uh, factory, of course. Yay. Uh, so um, I know that there's several many uh, uh, several uh, many. <laughs> other proxy that contribute to the code. And I also know that uh, if we want to approach the topic of agriculture from a, an archaeological perspective, the better way is always to go to a multi-proxy approach. But before starting, I want to say that right now, the study of phytoliths of biosilica deposition in plants and also of the silica uh, circle is a very hot topic uh, for many disciplines. And Fibrolith has also proven to be very good uh, proxy for the past. So again, I believe that each of these uh, aspects is uh, aspect is interesting, and should we should consider uh, each of, of 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 these if we want to understand more comprehensively how to trace down the effects of humans on the landscape. Since we start at least since we start collecting and choosing uh, the plants. And this is also the reason why I decided today to invite many uh, researchers coming from uh, different disciplines that include, of course, topology, from physiology, genetics, archaeology, and geology and soil science. Uh, because I really think that, well, first of all, for all of them, at least one or more <laughs> elements is part of the, uh, that you can see in this slide, it's part of the research and uh, I found uh, the idea of connecting discipline in this um, in, in this uh, in this sense really uh, interesting and uh, useful and I think that since we have more than 60 people connected online I don't know how many resist after <laughs> all of this but uh, at least yesterday night, we have more than 60 people that registered for the online uh, presentation and many more that wants, wanted to participate in present. I think that I'm not the only one finding this uh, need of trying to put together information and knowledge coming from a different uh, fields of research. Um, I wanted to, to say just like, uh, I will try to be super quick because we are kind of late. Uh, but before starting, uh, I want also to add this li little last information. And I want to emphasize that study in archaeology that focus on agriculture, on phytoliths, on silica circles, are not only a way to understand our path and give it values in the um, in the human trajectory, but they are also a very important connection and reference point in modern times. And uh, and I really think that in this way, we, we not only inform uh, our past, but also our present. And we will have like at least the possibility to try to change uh, uh, a little bit even the, the future. Uh, so thank you uh, so uh, um, so much for your uh, attention, and I will try to present right now super quickly uh, the first uh, speaker of today, that is Dr. Felix de Tronger. Uh, he is a soil scientist with a uh, uh, fascination for paleoplant uh, ecology. <laughs> 
Um, right now it's a Marie Curie fellow, but I know uh, that he has just won an amazing position, permanent position at the CNRS in Montpellier. So congratulations. Uh, and I leave you to, uh, to the <laughs> Just change I was working on my computer. Uh, have you tried to copy it first? And yeah, it? I, I copied it on the desktop. It just says that uh, there's something to repair. Okay. I try, try to say repair, or do you want to copy it again? Yeah, let's try repair. Okay, uh, basically, this is <laughs> really <laughs> <laughs> can, can, can you try with another one, like the one of Nana, just or yeah. whatever, just to see whether it's fine or all of them? Okay, maybe we can uh, we can try this uh and I use the key. Yes. Yeah. Okay, let's do that like this. Since we saw that the presentation of uh, Nanan is working, maybe we can have a switch. Uh I think that today we are uh, we are really have to be impro improvising and going a little bit freestyle. So I really uh, uh, say sorry for any inconvenience, but right now it's going to present uh, <laughs> Dr. Nanman Lee. <laughs> he, he was about to present anyway, so we are happy anyway. So he's a post, uh, Nanan is a postdoctoral post researcher at the Heinrich Climate Analysis and Research Unit uh, for the Department of Geography at the Manus University in uh, Ireland. And he's a paleoclimatologist <laughs> <laughs> and an expert in phytolith and geochemistry approaches uh, to infer past climate. Um, yes. Yeah. So I leave you the stage. <laughs> and yeah, really sorry for, for, for this inconvenience. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Nana. Um, uh, begin, like, before I start with my presentation, I really want to appreciate everyone that's been here. Uh, because, I mean, this is a really, really great chance for me to come here. And, and I really see like, how social networks it works here. So we can have like a very professional workshop like this. Well, <laughs> and kind of pressure for me to, to switch. <laughs> so yeah, I will try my best to give you like an impression of, uh, about my research. So before I start everything, I want to introduce myself. Uh, so uh, I am a like totally Chinese system educated <laughs> person. Like I started my PGD and my bachelor PGD in a same place in the northeast part of China, China. So it's a very cold place close to Russia and North Korea. In there, it's because the name of the country here. Uh, yeah, because I stayed there like 10 years. So I, I decided, oh, I, I'm, I'm done with the, the cold days. Like the, in the winter, it's always like minus 20 and also minus 30 in some case. So I, I, after my PhD, I decided to go to some warmer place. So I fly to <laughs> Shaman. So here is a tropical island city. It's really nice that like here. So to be honest, this is my second time to have my shorts here. Mm -hmm. because, uh, yeah, I started my contract last year in December, but I didn't get any chance to wear my shorts. <laughs> yeah, but like, anyway, that one to... Yeah. You can see really good warm weather here. <laughs> uh, let's read it. Uh, I started my new post of last year, last winter, yeah, in Ireland, which is quite gray, cloudy, windy, rainy. Uh, yeah, but before I moved to Ireland, I have been uh, visiting uh, Europe for a couple of times, mm -hmm. like working with different uh, groups. Uh, I was uh, visiting a postdoc in uh, Itaiji Eva, working on biomarker delta uh, D analysis. Mm -hmm. And before that, I went to France, worked with Anna uh, Alex Lam on the uh, triple oxygen ice cream well. so we are still working on the base set. <laughs> uh, 
So my research is this, as uh, Francis had said, uh, I'm working more on like pattern ecology, pattern ecology. I'm using words of proxies like pipeline and also carbon density carbon And so before I go into item, most of my work focuses on the like how uh, can precise the variabilities and the very impacts on the rest of the systems. Uh, but yeah, using like p type records, uh, lake sediments record. And afterward, uh, I'm currently working on the uh, blanket books in the island. So we try to evaluate the house climate impacts, the uh, carbon dynamics of blanket books in the island. So I, I was supposed to do a lot of field work to get speech first from different places in the island and then read the carbon data and analyze the uh, carbon contents and dynamics. Uh, yeah, everyone wants to know about our future, but why are you guys sitting here, like, talking about the past? So, yeah, to be honest, we have a lot of ways to, to understand the future, like using the climate models, where we can know every corner across the globe to be like how the climate will evolve in a couple of years later and what happened after to relate. But the reliability of this kind of prediction really depends on how we know the climate model. So, but, but up to our, um, like, as best to our knowledge, there's still uncertainties in the climate model because we're still not sure there's some, like, very vital physical processing uh, coupled in the climate model. So, we, there's always uncertainty in the climate model. So, in, instead of, like, dig deeper in the climate model, we have another way to understand that the future climate so is going back to the past. Uh, Say like uh, there's the most recent climate warming comparable to the 1.5 degree C increase in temperature is like uh, the optimum, which happens around like nine thousand years ago and last for five uh, thousand years. So, so if we want to really know like what will happen if the global climate increase by 1.5 degree C, we can already going back to the past to see like what, how the, the climate impacts on the terrestrial ecosystem and how the human res that respond to the planet warming on this kind of situation. But like we are not like in climate modeling, we always need a proxy, we always need like sediments to reconstruct the uh, our past. So here I show a uh, case like how we work with past. So we, we usually go to lay everything that we can read for the past and pit line. So we collect the cores and then we subsample the sample and we process with like extraction of pollen, extraction of pipe. So we count the deep assembly, uh, assemblage of pipe. So I, 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 I'm pretty sure that most of you should be know like how, how to count. But yeah, it's a kind of boring, but it's a lot of interesting and you can always get some surprising results from it. So the, the, the proxy we are talking about here today is the uh, Yeah, I'm sure you have very, uh, <laughs> very well understanding about the fighting, but I want to give some very brief introduction to the fighting. So I think that I found Janet uh, uh, articles practically being planned. So uh, the, the, the uptake of the fighting is were from the renewable uh, uh, monocyclic uh, monosilicate uh, acid, and they were uptake by the uh, plants and transport by uh, under the evap transpiration. And once the the water evaporates at the leaf sites, they will at practically the beginning or between like the plant cells. So they record the shapes of the, 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 the plant cells. Uh, because they are very small, we always need a microscope to 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 count and to observe them. Uh, compared to pollen, the factories have like three and five different characters this pollen. Of course, this, they have very, very little high density of uh, high density compared to pollen, so they won't be able to flow to everywhere. So they have very limited transportation. And uh, the path, they have like a silicate uh, structure, which means they are resistant to high temperature. Uh, acids and also oxidation conditions, so if they can preserve well even with birds and where. So there's a reason why like, we try to get some archaeological samples from the archaeological sites to, to see like, like what 
much tax they use for eating out of it. And uh, because it bears a taxification character, so we can use factories to, uh, uh, to serve as a complementary proxy to power to understand the vegetation variations. Uh, the advantage of factories is we can understand a better as a subfamily level of uh, healthy uh, species to, to understand like, how they, they respond to different damage. So uh, I would like uh, the, our final targets to reconstruct path to understand what we are eating before, uh, what we work with. The, but we always need like modern calibrations because it's like they shouldn't really. Once we, we go into the path, we only get the five piece assembly. But, but if we want to know what, what they are and we'll, how we can like really understand our past, we need a modern collection of the reference collections. We, we always need like modern tax collections with proxy database. It, it serves like a dictionary. So everything, every time we get uh, confused of like stuff, we need to go back to the reference collection and see what, what's happening. Uh, with, the, uh, with the increase uh, improvement of like uh, uh, mass spectrometry, so now we are able to measure the uh, oxygen isotopes of batteries as well uh, using the yeah this uh, like I would say it's, it's a quite complex uh, chemical process to get the batteries that I should measure. So yeah, if you really want to work with triple oxygen isotope, this complex and exam as the edge for us. Yeah, so the work I'm going to present here today is inspired by 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 Chinese like by Chinese calibration research. Uh, yeah, my last postdoc works I work with the marine geology, so I want to know like the what is the factors in marine settings. But but before that, every factor particles in marine settings came from the black, I would say. So I want to know. How how the terrestrial inputs to, to the ocean like, but before doing that, we can see that after I got a lot of the modern calibration sites of fighting synapses, we can see we didn't have a, like enough um, top soil samples in southern part of China. There are too many reasons to explain this. First, like most of Chinese scientists working on fighting, they were based on the northern part. So yeah, we didn't have a really warm like kind of I, I don't know if 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 the people working with spikes they didn't like the very warm climate. Yeah. I don't know, but <laughs> but the thing is that like in the subtropical area, which was shown in light green here, we didn't have like as much as plots in the northern part of China. And this, uh, I was here before, so we can hear yeah, our my previous group who wrote a lot of top soil calibrations on the assemblage. But when I moved to here, the subtropical area, I want to see like how was the uh, land looks like, the fabric assembly looks like in the subtropical forest. Uh, but when we go really think about the subtropical forest in China, it's, it's really like First is evergreen, so we have the green leaves all the year round. It's less seasonality, so everything you see is green. There's no winter at all. Like here, I'm not sure. I think we should have winter here. Yeah, yeah, but not that much, like minus twenty. No. <laughs> yeah, and also they have very very high biodiversity, especially trees. But all of these conditions play against to find trees. Why? Because the trees are not like very big, huge factories producers. So the trees, they didn't, like not all the trees produce factories, not all the trees they produce uh, like diagnostic factories, morphotypes that we can attribute them to, 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 the, uh, to the current plant. So all of these plays against the factory analysis. So that's, that's makes me a little bit worried. So, but still, we want to know like what it looks like, uh, uh, because we, we didn't get like a huge amount of money, so we, we focused on like a, a mountain a mountainous area, which we can sample the the plants. 
because use the month, we can use the, the space or time substitute, uh, substitution. So, like uh, along the elevation increase, the the vegetation changed from the evergreen and also uh, the conifer broad leaf mixed and also the uh, conifer and uh, to the up it's like a shrub middle. So we can see like a uh, different vegetation changes along the a uh, very small size. So we, we can collect our samples along this kind of transect. And also at the right hand, I show the uh, climate parameters, temperature, precipitation, relative humidity, and canopy coverage. So we can see that there are indeed the gradients of climate change. So finally, we go there and collect uh, 14 samples. We, we, we just climb the mountains like hiking and collect and measure the uh, use of uh, kind of uh, survey there. So finally, we get 14 samples. At the very base, we have like a human disturbed deforested uh, uh, shrubland, which because, uh, yeah, the human is destroying the original forest. But when you're moving up, there's evergreen forest and there's bamboo. And also there's conifers uh, for the mix. And also on the top is like a middle shrub, middle. Uh, for masters, we proceed the factory uh, extraction using the wet oxidation. So we use nitrate, concentrated nitrate acid to extract the factories and using the heavy density liquid to flow to the factory. Uh, because we didn't have like a very local observation for every part because they are very small transect. So we try to use the uh, 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 climate station data to generate every site is climate data. So we use this method and on the right panel, so we get the stationary climate observation. We try to generate a raster layer, and we, we get we into uh, plot our uh, climate data using this at a spatial resolution of 30 market to 30 meters squares. And we, at the same time, our vegetation indices was obtained using the satellite of imaginary at a spatial resolution of 30 multiple circuits. Yeah. Uh, after all, we get like five years assemblage and also parameter parameter, we use the uh, mathematical calculation, weighted to average in part of these squares, the regression to establish the relationship between five years assemblage and also the factor process. Now we have, we feel the result. So along the transect, we can see. So here is the top, and here is the bottom. Uh, so we can see uh, because we, we try to uh, subdivide the, the groups into uh, different uh, taxa. So like for trees, they produce the most of the effect on the left panel, and uh, for the grass short uh, cells, silica, uh, silica particles like. As the right hand, we can see that uh, with the increase of the elevation, the, uh, we see like a nine curves, five to the gradually decrease, while the grass shot cell factor increase along the elevation back here. Uh, plus, we have one site that looks quite different from the others, the human disturbance that we are aware of. Like, yeah, because we deforested the, the forest. So we have very much higher uh, grass short cell factor. We first compared our results with solid, but let's see uh, at the same area. So we can see that our factory results briefly reflects the composition of the um, vegetation along the elevation transect. So on, on the every left panel of each figure, they are pollen results on the right one, the, 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 the black one, they are factory results. So we can feel that with the increase of elevation, there's indeed like kind of uh, decrease of every factory. So here, oh, so here, like uh, the broad leaf and also the conifers, they a great increase here. And uh, for, this, this one is uh, uh, the, the shrub on the top of the mountains. 
So they have like gradually increased as well. And for the foreign species, we try to get some, some of them like, but they are not like everywhere, plus their percentage are really, really low here. For grass, we uh, observe just um, almost the same like uh, character. Like, and here, we, we indeed see an uh, increase in the policy pollen here after that, and also increase in grass show cell packages as well. So it, it looks like it's, there's a really good match, but we should be aware that the general trend is comparable, but we should pay attention to the percentages. So like, like for the uh, tree pollen, we have a like very high percentage compared to the compared to the phytis, and for the grass straw cell phytis, the assembly can super higher than the pollen. So it means that the phytis can over represent the presence of grass, I would say. But despite that, we, as we said, we try to see like if there's really um, something controls the uh, assembly change on the average, so we, we, did, we, we do find like Correlations between the elevation and each uh, 5D's assembly age and percentage. So, when we want to see like what is the fact that controls the uh, variation of 5D. So, so, we run an REA analysis. So, it seems like the 5 is classified to different groups. On the left is like the grass short cell 5D. And so, the increase with the elevation, like but here and for the tree uh, the canopy coverage, so they they decrease with the increase of elevation. So we can see that the nine the, the, the nine curve five feet they, they, they were like already in the right line. So like it seems there's indeed some kind of mathematic uh, correlations plus if we want to see uh, there's a correlation between the, the grass structure cell phytis and also the mean and the temperature. And so, with the increase of elevation, we try to establish every parameter that we can to see like what's the factor influence of phytis or cell phytis distribution like states. So, if you bear this in mind, because we have a great increase with the elevation uh, transect. So to be honest, we can reconstruct everything. But this is not the truth. Because like we work with very, very short transect in a very, very narrow area on the globe. So it's really, really short elevation. It's, I think the elevation range is like less than 1,000 meters high. So, but, but because the climate uh, variables are kind of um, results with the elevation change. So we can see, like, we can re reconstruct every climate period. But the thing is, we can't do that because they might be challenged by the future investigation. Or, like, if someone tried to use our, our model to reconstruct other areas, they may, might get very surprised if they do say, like, our calibration is focused on the subtropical area. But if people from the northeast part of China, which the winter degrees like minus 20, they might get a very surprised temperature. So we try to think about so what is the real factor to influence the, the change of factories assembly as the observed here. So we decided not working with any temperature, precipitation, relative humidity reconstruction instead of uh, canopy coverage. Why? I'm going to explain. explain sorry. So we, we try to get the uh, field plant, especially the ground layer observations. So there's ecologists that they work with the, the modern uh, plant uh, survey. So they, 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 they summarize the outfit. The only the ground floor curves. So we can see that at the, when, uh, at the lower elevation of the transect, they are most dominated by the foreign species and also the siege. 
but with the increase of elevation the topography and also the um, compressive compressive I don't know the English for this but the the the, the, the light and the driving uh, tolerance uh, species they are increased. So we try to get an explanation to this because this is also observable uh, during the field work. So we have a uh, basic understanding like when the uh, at the very lower elevation, so that we say like dense canopy coverage. So it was so dense that they prevented the light reaching to the ground floor. So they, they only allow like the uh, shadow tolerance species like forest, like this uh, cypress, they, they grow there. But when the, it's gradually open and to, to the very uh, like totally open knees, so this enables the, the grass, which like they can be more diverse and also the light light. So this is a basic idea like how we develop our models. So we, we try to brief, uh, summarize in like this. So when the, the canopy structure is determines like how much sunlight reach to the ground floor. So which like finally eventually like determines the, the ground floor's curves. And then this will be reflected by, by this assemblage. So this is our basic idea. So finally, we, 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 we try to work with the canopy coverage reconstruct to develop a model to, to explain this. Uh, at the end of this, I try to try to like uh, get some summary for this. So the so the idea is that we saw the structure of forest is like can is is kind of like modeling the determines the determines the ground floor of, uh, species composition, and then this can be reflected by the five percent. So, and the second take home message is not every climate of variables can be reconstructed for fighting, especially for fighting, because unlike like pollen, we have like a very one to one corresponding re relationship between pollen and also the species. But for fighting, we always like have a redundancy corresponding relationship. Like one plant can produce more than one type of fighting, and also the why even uh, fighting morphotypes can be produced by a lot of plants as well. So this will complex the, the, the model. So uh, yeah, sometimes we can really get that very reliable uh, relationships with the uh, math modeling, but this cannot be true. We should find a potential mechanism to try to understand or try to explain what controls the Fight with assemblage change instead of just the, even the observation results to see okay just the groups. Uh, the final the, the final notes we want to uh, say is that fight with assemblage might be able to serve better in quite uh, quantitative canopy coverage reconstruction because fight is going to be blown to everywhere. Like the uh, the pollen assemblage on the top story of this transect. They can be like there are some vertical transportations along the elevation because there's some wind along the elevation. So there might be a uh, possibility for, for pollen to be blown to upward or downward. But for bikes, yeah, the only possibility is we blow their leaves to everything. But, but, but from our uh, study here, so it seems like bikes might be able to perform. Well, here. So, what to do next? <laughs> yeah, we need more calibration for sure. So, so uh, I have like collected another two uh, mountainous areas in in southern part. So, so here I show the result from here. But we are still working with like even southern part of Transac and also the northern part to see like because they have totally different, no, not totally different, but they have different temperature and also precipitation, we can use this to examine like whether this is climate controlled or whether this is like herbaceous uh, grass layer control factors influencing the uh, variation of factors of average. So that's all. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.
Yeah, very, very interesting talk. Actually, I'm really happy to have you here because, um, um, yeah, I'm. The thing that we can use even Python leads to detect the canon decoder. It's it's a thing I have never think about before reading. <laughs> <laughs> and it's something I really think we should take into consideration, uh, especially when we, we look at the past uh, register so the past uh, five minutes. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's some question in the room or in the chat. Uh, I have a general question yeah. from someone who's pretty ignorant yeah. about five minutes. Are there five minutes that don't hang around, that are recycled very quickly, and therefore you need to have some kind of knowledge of what's happening now to be able to see what happened back then, because they just are not there in the record. You mean like the dissolution of the project? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that much about like how they recycle them. Like, yeah, the thing we're working is that we just collect the topmost soils, so which we suppose it will reflect the most of it in the like a decadal scales to see the, the, how they, they collect the seed from the plants. So we suppose it will reflect the seed like we hope like 30 years around because the climate data is like 30 years average value. So that's 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 that my thing. But to be honest, I didn't understand that much like how. How long is the turnaround? Like the, 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 the period of like they are to, to be honest, yeah. Because I, I always suppose like they can be resist to the dissolution, but, but I don't know how long. Like if there's any any study about this, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. But maybe yeah. there are. Like, don't think. But no, my, my question was related to that. Have you done uh, only soil fibers, not from the plants from they are growing in the area? Because this can give you some information on that. Yeah, you mean like the soil like the, the plant that grows there and yeah. do they and estimate what phytolites and what is the concentration of phytolites for, for that particular plant? So okay. you can compare with the soil. Yeah. And see what remains or which ones have been uh -huh. or I don't know. Yeah, yeah. See, I mean, I what think... is the percentage of the, the relevance of each plant in the soil? Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, we, yeah. we've done this, and, yeah. that, and, and it's not always the same. And no, also, no, yeah, yeah. We also look at the same plant in different geographical areas, yeah. and the production of phytolites is different. Yeah. So you may need to take that into account. Also. Okay. Oh, and it's something we can check. Yeah, 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 sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for your amazing <laughs> presentation and, and, and work. Um, so yeah, sure. since we are still um, uh, facing uh, <laughs> some issues with the presentation of uh, Felix, uh, if Rosa doesn't mind, maybe we can <laughs> we can uh, skip to her uh, presentation. Uh, I think that everybody knows, <laughs> everybody <laughs> who studies Pythonic knows yeah. <laughs> that he was, and she is a pioneer in, in, the, uh, in the study of Pythonic, that's for, for sure. An archaeologist. And, <laughs> yeah, and I, and I was about to say, um, you are an archaeologist, so, uh, and focus on micro archaeology. Um, Hi, Okay, everything is okay? Oh, well, <laughs> maybe, we'll see. Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, oh I'm not sure. I'm not sure. So, I removed them from the computer. <laughs> okay, so thank you uh, so, uh, so much for being here. Today with us, and I give you. <laughs> okay. So good morning to everyone, and uh, yeah, I wanted to thank you, Francesca, for inviting me here. So that's uh, I'm very happy. And uh, so what I'm going to talk is about the phytoliths and other microarchaeological remains 
a uh, combined uh, as a tool to understand land uses in land in a uh, landscape, but I'm going to talk mostly in our, on archaeological sites. I'm not going to talk about agriculture, so I leave that for you. <laughs> and uh, so I will try what, I, what I'm going to do is to give you some basic ideas that you all know, but just to let you know how we use them when we did with archaeological sites and uh, give you some examples of studies that we've done and how we integrate the different uh, macro and micro remains because I think that's basic. I mean, if we don't integrate, we're going to miss part of the information. So I'm, I'm always very strong in combining these different approaches. So the first question is, can fighters help us to understand land uses and climate conditions in the past? So. And if, what was the role of plants for past populations, uh, how past populations interacted with the surrounding landscape, and how past populations were affected by changing landscape conditions? These are very general questions that we always ask when we need to look at archaeological sites. Uh, just, uh, I guess you all know, fighters have been just in archaeology more or less since the 70s in a very regular way. Uh, and then in these last years, they have been, uh, of course, fighters are not the perfect tool, and they have many limitations that we need to overcome when, the, when studying archaeology. So what we've been doing, uh, many researchers have been doing in the last year, is try to overcome some of these limitations, uh, like, for example, improving taxonomic identification, which I think is the most <laughs> obvious for us. Uh, and uh, where possible, they have been integrated with other archaeobotanical or geographical proxies uh, to improve geoarchaeological geo interpretation. So I'm not going to repeat on that, but I wanted to put this because I wanted to show, uh, I mean, you all know about this, but uh, what, what some of these aspects, characteristics of fighting is that they are important for us. What do we need to take into account? Okay. We, uh, Nina, Nina, I'm sorry. Nana. Nana. That's okay. You already explained it. Some of this. Uh, one of the main things is that uh, pythons they can last for millions of years, so we can find them in many archaeological sites. Actually, we've been working many years in Africa, working with two million sediments, so I will find them, and sometimes a lot. Uh, the resistance of the Silica of the phytolis to the pH is more or less to 2.5. To and uh, that's in highly alkaline conditions for phytolis, or maybe not all sometimes, but some of them they may dissolve, which can bias or hinder our morphological interpretation. So that's, I wanted to come here because I think uh, and this is something that we try to do a lot is understanding the process, positional process at a particular site, site so to know what's going on. Uh, for improving the interpretation of the archaeological record. Otherwise, we can just give fake interpretations or wrong interpretations because we need some of the hydrates. As part of the living plant, they become part of the sediment, the, the phytolith, so when the organic material decays. So when we find phytoliths, uh, they can represent the plant input to a particular area in an archaeological site, for example, if we are looking at the storage pit. Uh, so it means that the plant material that was deposited there, the organic material decays, and then we find the phytolites. Uh, and also the local vegetation. I'm not going to go to the climate and vegetation today, so. Uh, okay, they represent the cellular tissue. Uh, most commonly the epidermal, and uh, they can be identified as a single, which is the first one, or in a, what we call a multicell or interconnected cell structure, which is this one here. Uh, so when we find a phytoly, one of the first information of, that we obtain is the anatomical provenience of the phytoly, and thus the part of the plant represented in certain archaeological context. Uh, context. So we can see if this the stem, the inflorescence, the liquid, if there is a whole plant. So we can guess a, fir a first approach to that. Uh, but as you said, <laughs> they don't only fill the cells, but also they simplify the cell walls or the intercellular spaces. So in these cases, it becomes difficult to identify the origin of the phytoly. And this is why when uh, we look at the morphological uh, nomenclature, so we find phytolites that we name by the taxonomical or anatomical name, 
But many times we need to define the phytoliths by need them by geometrical name because we don't know. And uh, so in addition, some of the phytoliths are less silicified than others, which affect the preservation. But when we see these phytoliths that we know that they don't preserve, so it means that we have very stable conditions and they have been a quick deposition and they have been preserved. So this is very good news for us because it gives us, then we can, we can know that at least if there are some phytoliths that they have been dissolved, uh, there are not that many or the most important remain. Oh, sorry, that's the same. That was, these two, they are not uh, so commonly found in archaeological sites. Sages, they just, uh, they did this with the modern soil, modern plant and modern soils, and sages, they, did, they yeah. practically disappeared immediately. Yeah. Ah, uh, well, the scapical redundancy, which you know, the similar morphotypes can occur in different plants. So, in later years, in order to improve uh, this uh, taxonomical or anatomical interpretation, so there have been different approaches to try to improve that, like morphometry in the late, in the 90s and until now, and more recently, the use of artificial intelligence. So, there will be, I don't know the next one, because I'll make changes, but there will be a talk on this later on. Uh, it, and another approach is to improve taxonomic identification of phytoliths with other archaeobotanical approaches, such as pollen or seeds, that they can give us, give us taxonomic information. Uh, the differential production of phytoliths. Not all the plants produce phytoliths and they, in the same amounts and depends on different factors. One of them is the genetic. So we, we all know that monocotyledonious grasses, palms, and sedges, they produce many phytoliths, while trees, they do not produce that many, and some of the trees, they don't produce at all. And uh, the, also the environment, the presence of silica in the soil, and the climatic. So that's why I'm always very insistent to try to collect uh, reference samples from the local area that I'm studying. Yeah. Uh, to understand the representativity of plants uh, in archaeological context, that's another point. Uh, they need to be quantified. Quantified means to estimate the concentration of phytoliths in a place, in a certain area, because this will give us the, the relevance of plants. This is an example. This is from my PhD many years ago. But uh, this is one of the first times we did this qualitative analysis. So we collected samples from outside the cave, the soil. And uh, that was Terra Rosa growing in the, in the area next to the Barra Cave. And we found, we estimated the amount of phytoliths, it was about 60,000. But when we look inside the cave, we found 4 million. So this means that there is a big concentration of plants. So what I wanted to say with this is that it's very important to quantify phytoliths. Yes. Because they will give us a comparison with the with samples that we are not interested or the control samples that we want. Well, just uh, the C14 dating of phytoliths, uh, they have, uh, well, the various studies know that the presence of a small amounts of uh, organic carbon. Uh, the carbon is trapped in the silicified A cells and remains within the phytolith immune to cause the position alteration and high temperatures. This is a sample that was born like at 550 and this is at nine, almost 900. I will, I'm not going to go back to this again. But this black area, this is carbon. Uh, and uh, well, several authors have used this carbon to date phytoliths and just put these references. There are more, but not as many as uh, we would like. I mean, this is something that there are lots of discussions on uh, if the uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, comes from the photosynthesis or if it's a contamination of the soils or that. And not all the authors agree on that, but it would be very nice that they managed to find a reliable <laughs> the burning of phytoliths. Uh, this is very important, in, for, particularly for the sites that I, I work. So I work a lot with fire and health place. Health. So phytoliths are resistant to fire conditions and can remain morphologically recognizable up to 750 and 800 degrees. However, at lower temperatures, there are already some uh, cells of burning, such as a darker color that usually appears. 550, more or less, is 100. 
And the other, another uh, tool that we use a lot is the, uh, a lot is the Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, the FPIR, that they can provide together with the phytolids a higher detail on the temperature. We will show an example of that. Okay, so we go to an archaeological site and uh, where can we find phytolids? Uh, so we find them uh, in any place that plants work. And, uh, uh, and we can use them, as we said, they have long durability, so we can use them at different periods, uh, chronological periods from uh, like two, year, two days ago to millions of years, so we, we see them. And uh, geographical regions, we do some type of, of tests and we find uh, in, in different areas. So the information that we can obtain can give us information on the diet. But it can give us information on the fire, how they were making the fire, which fuel they were using, which collecting strategies they were taking, they were using to collect the wood of all their plants, if they were using other type of plants for tinder to start the fire. So then uh, for medicine and hygienic purposes, so to eliminate the uh, insects, they can use uncertain plant, plants, for example, in caves. Uh, transport shelters, so the roofs, the, the walls, or the roof of the floors. I mean, they were using plants, so they've been using plants uh, in the past for many years. And also the manufacture of tools with lots of containers. All this information will depend, of course, on the archaeological context that we are going to analyze. And, and also with the landscape, so the interaction, the adaptation to the surrounding landscape. This is, I use this, uh, we use this for when we study hominids and modification of the surrounding landscape to what needs for the changes. So we, this is some examples of remains that we can find phytolids. Like the first one is an elephant there, very rich in phytolids. <laughs> uh, uh, right the uh, storage field, the vessel, the tea, the, uh, all of these, they will give a different information, as we said. The phytolids extraction, so we, Use, uh, in our lab, we use different protocols. We don't use a single protocol, so we try to adapt to the different conditions because they may change. If it's too organic, then we will modify it a little. But anyway, what we usually do is this, first, this uh, protocol, which is the rapid, because you can have uh, samples after 20 minutes, so you can look at the microscope. So <laughs> then, of course, I mean, they are not the perfect sample, but it is very useful because it's very quick. And then if you need a uh, pattern detail and you need to get the better samples, you do the process again, but at least you know what's, what's there. And it, it does quite a reliable quantitative uh, information on the phytolids. And this, as I said, uh, phytolids alone uh, can, can provide important information, but when Combined with other proxies, the information obtained can provide a more complete interpretation of the archaeological record, which, after all, this is what we want. Uh, so I'm going to now give three examples, I think there are three examples of different studies that we've done. Uh, so although the identification of phytolids, as we said, uh, to the species level is not always easy, the combined study with archaeological remains can provide further detail, details, not only for the identification of the species, but also for the identification of different processes for the storage and processing of prey. And this is an example that we have that I like very much, but unfortunately we couldn't publish it yet because we were stressed, waiting for isotopes and I don't know how, what the situation is now. <laughs> But <laughs> our part was really nice. <laughs> so during the excavation, they found different structures, like a roasting structures, this parto basket that they found seeds from barley and wheat, the grinding stores, grinder and a house, etc. So we, we took samples from different contexts and we analyzed the phytolith. So based on the fact that phytolids are in the husk of the grain, but not in the grain, and the grain contains mostly starch. So we did the, the analysis. We we, uh, we analyzed the samples in two, with two different processes: one for the phytolids and another one for these um, the starches that uh, they are more. Uh, I mean, you dissolve them when you do the phytolid extraction. 
So in the Sparta basket, we found the phytoliths from the husk, mostly, uh, which was associated with the seed remains and the starches. So we found lots of phytoliths and lots of starches in a Sparta basket that they, was, they found the, the seeds. So we interpreted this as like they had probably collected the seeds not long ago and they kept them in the basket and then the fire started and that was it. So like before doing anything, then we analyzed like a binder and then we found phytoliths from the inflorescence against from the husk and the starches. So we interpret this as like they were trying to dehusk the grain. But then we look at the handmaids and there we found very little amount of phytoliths but a very high number of starches. So they were probably grinding already the, the flour. So this is one, uh, I, I like very much this study, so we did. <laughs> Did I come out yet? Okay. Uh, Phytalis combined with FDIR can help to determine the temperature rates. This is a study that we did in uh, Kim in Guerrera in Israel. We did a multi proxy approach that included the FDIR, the SEIN, the clarity calibration, radiocarbon, and phytalis. In the green excavations, they identified two different chambers. Uh, which is the upper chamber, you can see it in the picture up there, and uh, it was full of broken pottery and that the clay calibration and the FDIR showed that the clay had gone about around 1,000 degrees, so it was a very high temperature. And then the lower chamber, that with gray, gray powdered sediment, which is this one with the arrow, and these uh, two samples here, and which was interspirited by several layers of of flat shirt. So we analyzed these two samples. As you see, we found an incredible amount of fibers. <laughs> of these, 49% were in multi cells, so were in anatomical correction, and a 40, almost 50%, 47 and 50% corresponded to the husk. And the concentration of fibers was huge, 16 million and 22 million. So it was just that they, they had put the plants there and, uh, and put them to to pile. Uh, the, you can see the pictures, so that's huge. Our work was trying to count them. <laughs> uh, the dominance of the phytoliths indicate that the fuel, the fuel was mainly derived from grasses with a high number of multi cells and dendritic. Phytoliths, as you can see, were darker in color and show what some biorefringents, which is this. So you know that when you look at the microscope, if you, look, if you use the polarized light, you don't see the phyton, yeah. but here you see this by retrinters. And this happens when you heat the phyton it above 700 degrees. Uh, because then the silica becomes 700, 800, depending on the, on the plant, becomes cristobalite, which is another phase of the silica that becomes, forms after uh, high temperature. And then certain cells, like the papillate, which is that we showed before, you see they present it again, this dark part, again, this dark area. Uh, you see, these are the FTIRs. Uh, the first one is this uh, archaeological sample. And the second one is the spectra of cristobalite, which is this uh, silica, uh, silica mineral. And the third one is the grass, I think, no? The silica one. Uh, okay, so the most important thing you need to take, I mean, the, the silica is this uh, 11.2 and 10.90, 10.94. And um, together with this uh, 7.96, the 8.73 and the 14.58 and the, in the archaeological sample is calcite. But the most important thing you need to check here is this 622 and 621, which is a characteristic peak for the cristobalite. So we see them in the archaeological sample. And we saw also the microfringers. So it means that the sample had gone to at least this temperature where the cristobalite starts forming. Uh, what we did after this uh, muffled fauna, fauna test, so we collected 3 people mice people and uh, we burned it at eight hour, uh, during 8 hours of 550 and 4 hours at 700, 800 and 800 to see how it was changing the phytoliths with temperature. So phytoliths became darker in color, mostly at 700. 
By refringence, star the toxin to be seen at 700, considering the appear appearance of the cristobalite characteristic peak and the FTIR. And uh, at the 900, the, the phytalis were practically melted and unrecognizable, but you could still find them in the 800. So, the ash in the tiny chamber is the product produced by burning some type of bread, which I saw. This is the conclusion. Most likely, critical material. We didn't assume, we didn't see many diversity in morphological types. It was like 10, 12 morphotypes all over. So, it means that there was a uh, uh, concentration of probably the same plan or at least two or three plants, not that much. And um, and that would uh, have accumulated in the chamber. I didn't write it here. We didn't discard the possibility of using them, but uh, sterilized this sort at 650. And uh, we have uh, we found indications that in the past they could use the, the chalk on the straw as a fuel in the fields. So we left it like this. Uh, so the phytalis from the grain powder sediment were burned about 700. And below 900, because we could recognize the five of it. So we're in this, uh, in this range. Uh, and then what we did is the uh, papillary, we took that sample with the dark tips, uh, we took it to the Raman spectroscopy and confirmed that there was carbon. So carbon had been preserved after 900, which is amazing. <laughs> Combined another uh, approach that we use is down spherolites. I'm not sure if you're familiar with them. They are uh, crystallized calci uh, calcite particles that they are producing the digestive tract of many ruminants, mostly cows, sheep, and goats. And uh, you find them in the, in the sheep, in the duck. And uh, these, together with the fact that they can provide information for identifying husband, husband activities of past populations. So we've been doing this type of studies both in outside urban context, like Fumier deposits. This is one uh, paper that just came out on this, which is Monica's uh, work. And, uh, ah, and then inside the urban context, sorry, <laughs> which is the example that I gave. Uh, this is another site that though is also in Israel. It was a major port on the Eastern Mediterranean coast within the late Bronze Age and Iron Age. And we identified a number of light layers, uh, including brown, gray, and white layers with different results. So phytoliths were very abundant. I will show you now how abundant they were. <laughs> the white layers contain a higher amount of phytoliths from the inflorescence. Uh, than gray and brown layers, that they had more leaves. And the phytolites from the gray layers had been burnt. Uh, and the, then we also found the sperolites and phytolites in not all the areas, but in, in many of them. So the first one is the sperolite. When you look at the cross polar eye light, you get this uh, distinctive cross. You see the dark, the color of the phytolites. So we didn't, we haven't done this experiment that I just showed you before, but uh, now we could guess the temperature with the results that we, that we obtained. You see the, the papillate again with the carbon there. And uh, in my, this, this is what I wanted to show you, how rich the sample was. This is the FTIR of this archaeological sample. It's practically identical, identical to the critical maestro. It's amazing. So it means that when we look at the when we analyze the sample, we didn't have to do any extraction process, any chemical extraction. So we just took the sample, prepared the slide, and that's it. Because it was pure silica. <laughs> <laughs> this also happened in, a, in, a, in another site that I'm, not, uh, that I'm not talking. I mean, it happened to a, a real stocking later in Dutch and Brown that some of the samples we also found this. So it's amazing. So it was incredible. I was counting. <laughs> uh, as a conclusive remarks from the uh, the, the Lord, the gray and white layers that reflect different user, uses. Some phytolites rich layers were probably the result of being formed from them in animal enclosures. And this brings to another question, which is what was the original thickness of the deposit? 
So I, Ruthie was doing the, the counting. I don't remember exactly, but she calculated that with this shaha. And uh, so, because we found, I don't, I don't remember how many, but it was like eight centimeters thick or something like that. So imagine if everything was silica with that, imagine the original uh, thickness. <laughs> So this uh, reduction has important implications that you need to take into account. It's another thing when you find these kind of uh, things. And that's the last example. This, uh, this is in Nugada Hamama site in Jordan. This is an important site for understanding middle upper paleolithic transition in the Levant. And, uh, but uh, had, serious, had been seriously altered by Sheffers during the 20th century that distort part of the layer B, which was dated in 44 to 40,000 years. So what our work here was to investigate the post depositional, not that much the phytons, because we saw, but not that many, not that many, but we wanted to understand the post depositional processes and what happened there, because all, all of these disturbance and everything. And with a special focus on possible impacts on the plant archaeological record. So we follow this multi-proxy approach that included the phytoliths, micromorphology, FTIR, fecals, sterilites, the charred seeds, carbon, and the C14 data. Ah, uh, I just summarize the results. Uh, the results allow the identification of different positional processes affecting different areas of the paleolithic layer, which is the well, you have here the, the map. And uh, the green is the squares with limited layer B, squares with well preserved macrobotanical remains, and squares uh, with much of all layer B stuff. Because what the shepherds did, they went there, they started to excavate, they kept the animals, they mixed up everything. So uh, that was very difficult. So what we did is we, we started to analyze and we saw that this, the fecal spherolites were quite well distributed uh, with the disturbance. So we use them as, a, as to, to delimitate the area, the disturbed area. And then we compare the, our results with other results for the micromorphology particularly. And uh, so we saw uh, the identification of the fact that the calisterolites showed that modern disturbance why it was serial, seriously affected the central area of the cave. In, cons in contrast, the eastern and western areas close to the walls, they were not modern disturbance and the archaeobotanical remains represent the disturbed areas of activity. The different grass phytoliths and macrobotanical remains indicate that during the early upper Paleolithic occupation, there were wetter areas and Mediterranean woodland vegetation. There was a lake in that time, Lake Lisa. So, and some of the phytoliths that we found, they, they, they were uh, consistent with the presence of that lake. Uh, but we also found, uh, uh, found early adapted grasses, like the savants, for example. So we also saw some type of phytoliths and charcoal in the hertz, the micromorphology identified uh, for intact hertz. Uh, and the presence of phytoliths, I thought phytoliths and charcoal indicates that uh, uses, the uses of QL along with grasses, we also identified grasses, they might have been used as timber. We also see, I didn't talk about this, the presence of silicious aggregates. I don't know if you know what it is. It's a mix. Uh, they are they that originated in the wood in the wood of dipods and it's like a matrix of silica with different of, with different other minerals. Sometimes it's difficult to identify them under the microscope because like, they look like clay, but they, they can be identified in the FDIR. And uh, so but we so we saw the presence of silicious aggregates in and around the heart suggesting ash dispersion the word dispersing the ash of that. And finally, we also found free phytoliths, uh, probably anthropogenic origin, that complements the microbotanical remains of, the, of edible seeds. So we think they were part of the diets. Um, okay. Yeah. I didn't, ah, ah, here. I didn't write the oh, story, the reference. Monica <laughs> will Okay, so it was just published. <laughs> In Journal of Archaeological Science. 
So just a final remarks uh, on phytoliths. Phytoliths are a powerful tool in archaeology to identify plant remains from different contexts and archaeological remains. I'll give you some examples. Uh, you can apply them in different periods and chronological regions, and the information, this is important, it will depend on the context from where they are collected. I mean, you really need to be perfect. Uh, can be used as an independent tool sometimes, but many other times they need to be integrated with other processes. Uh, the selection of these disciplines will vary in relation to the aim of the study, so we not we don't always use the same process. So depending on the context, what we want to identify, then we will use the different types of remains or different types of study. So we are quite uh, open to <laughs> integrate different studies. Uh, so sometimes we, do, we use starches, fecal sterilized, diatoms, we've been using diatoms also. Uh, as pseudomorphs, which is also is of calcium oxalates that uh, they are in the wood and when they get born they become ash cellulomorphs, pollens with charcoal, chemical analysis, etc. And uh, well, that is just uh, what do we want to go from here? I mean, improve taxonomic identification by taking advantage of other scientific advantages, advantages like uh, deep learning, which is what we will talk later, or laser scanning of focal microscope, improve use of pythonics for supporting. And improve our understanding of the formation of phytoliths in different plants and in different cells, because this also will help us to understand the post depositional processes and what happened, why we find some phytoliths from some plants, but we don't find others independently uh, because of preservation. And uh, availability and that is a standardization of modern reference plants. I mean, that's very important to transform these modern reference collections from the area of the study. Because as we said, the, the production of items changes in the same plant in different geographical area, different altitudes. So you really need to, to see what's uh, in the area. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rosa. I, I want to, to to say that Monica put uh, on in the chat uh, all the reference. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so if you are interested to look in on on, uh, on the papers, I was in that rush last night. I think I finished like at nine of. Uh, um, so I don't know if um, anybody wants to to make questions to Rosa. Yeah. Oh. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, <I'm not. laughs> I give my question is very specific. I find it difficult to identify the difference between the spherulites from the starch in in the in the practice because it's, I, I it's I, difficult. Yeah, I saw. I thought I was seeing lots of starch, and then my professor in Brazil, no, these are spherulites, and I was like, oh my god, I can't. Yeah, yeah, no, it is, it is difficult. You need uh, quite uh, practice with that. It's I can I mean make. When it's a uh, cereal structure, they are easier to identify because they, they are more rounded and they have like these very tiny circles around it. So that's easier to identify. But sometimes it, it can become a, a difficult, but the spherulites are quite homogeneous. So mm. that's generally, but not always smaller than statues. Generally, yeah. 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 <laughs> also, if, you the I mean, yeah. if you look at the potato starch, yeah, yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's something that you need some practice. It's uh, it's not an easy task. <laughs> it, I would suggest just to look at reference collections of both, and uh, until you get. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Yes. Do sterilites survive fire? It's very nice. Uh, um, the same as uh, starches, about six hundred or something. So I'm wondering how much of your Path material could be from burnt down. First. Yeah, that's that's the pro. I mean, we we can say uh, this is what we said that we cannot discard like uh, in the kiln they were not using them, and actually in Teldor, in some areas we saw the sterilites, but in other areas we didn't. But according to the micromorphology, Ruthie thinks that they were not there because they had been dissolved. So you need, this is one of these situations that you need to complement with other, with other processes. And it's also, it's also yeah, it's a, a matter of where you are in the world because I've, yeah. I've studied uh, dance, like 
fresh, modern dung, well, not fresh, dry, <laughs> <laughs> modern dung, cow dung from India, and they had no sterilized whatsoever. Nothing, mm. not one. So, you know, <laughs> it's a uh, yeah, it's uh, tricky, but it, yeah, it's like what I was saying, you know, it's all a matter of where you are, the con like the location, the content, yeah. the, and, 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 and then you can take options. as much reference as possible yeah. for the from difference the that you want to study. Yeah. From the book, huh? That's uh that's it's it's a lot of work, but I think <laughs> it's, it's the only way that we can give proper answers. I have a quick questions on the burning. Um, the the color. Um, is, you said it's related to the temperature. Mm -hmm. That well, it can be also organic. Yeah. No, no. But uh, what about the duration of burning? Do you know if it has any effect? Whether it's it's been longer in the fire or or it was. I mean, I think we saw it. We saw it after four hour after four hours. Okay. So. So you started seeing straight yeah. like. Yeah, 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 because we only did one, one experiment with eight hours, okay. which was the 550, which was mm -hmm. nothing. Yeah. And then uh, the other ones, we did it at four hours, oh, and, we saw, and we saw the darker. Okay. But, the start, but I also, I, uh, I think that it's not always, it's not the same in all the plants. So, right. again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's really interesting, though, that, uh, you know, just uh, that you can more or less understand the temperature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that was very yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the, the other person, we did, I didn't show it here, but with FTIR, if you look at the base of a heart, uh, and you look, you do the clay, which was, then you can, this can also give you temperature. Okay, yeah. In yes. situ, so depending, right. because there is this experiment heating clay at different temperatures, mm -hmm. so depending on where the your sample is in this list, in the different FTIRs, you can know more or less the temperature reached by certain higher. Perfect. Sorry. Sorry. Ah, sorry. <laughs> that, that, that was really, really interesting. Uh, so we finally managed to have the presentation of Philippe uh, working. So I guess it's your turn. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's your turn. Uh, oh, no. So. <laughs> And I'm not sorry, sorry. <laughs> and we have a very. I will try to be quick. Very, no, it's not a very yeah. important. Uh, this is this is this is why we're all, we're all here, you know. Yeah, because that's yeah. municipal, so we need to understand why and how. So. So thank yeah. Thank you so much. No, no. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you to you. Uh, thanks to you for all the organization and stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm more like, uh, so yeah, I come from soil science, but I'm really doing trade-based ecology now. Uh, and I'm quite obsessed by this question, even though, of course, that's a uh, spoiler idea. So spoiler alert, I won't be able to answer that question. Not today, probably not uh, for many years, I guess. But uh, this is, yeah, what uh, I am doing now. So I didn't, uh, no. Yeah, I didn't start to work on silicon by working on plant silicon. I really come from soil science and biology and chemistry. And uh, silicon cycling really matters for all different reasons. Uh, this is a very simplified way of seeing like soil plant, system, soil plant systems. The weathering of silicates in soil uh, consumes CO2 on geological time scales. So we have this carbon silicon iteration on uh, long, long, long time scales. And you also have this silicon transfer, dissolved silicon transfer towards the hydrosphere and the diatoms, right, in marine ecosystems. And the diatoms, they are very important marine uh, carbon pump. So uh, silicon is really rooted in uh, long-term uh, biogeochemical uh, cycles. But of course, the soil plant systems as plants, uh, so biogenic silicon. And of course, it influences the soil plant silicon cycling at the very least, if not maybe at a larger time scale. So, uh, because actually, as the biogenic silicon, once in soil, I know that it can be used in paleo science, it works very well in the specific conditions, but of course, it can also be dissolved. Uh, but we uh, actually we already talked about that. So, opening this box of biogenic silicon uh, in biogeochemistry and this kind of ecosystem scale uh, really matters uh, to see and trying to understand uh, what is the variation of silicon concentration in plants, right? 
And uh, the good news for us as scientists, I guess, is that it's not crystal clear. Uh, I mean, uh, silicon is always presented as an anomaly of silicon in biology, more recently to be like surrounded by uh, several controversies. So it's not, uh, it's not crystal clear why you have such a large variation of silicon concentration in plant, why plants use it a lot, why others don't. I guess one of the most uh, striking observations about plant silicon is that it's considered as a non ancient subnutrient, right? Plants don't actually need it, uh, even though some say, some speaks about a quasi, quasi essential nutrient. Uh, and yet, it's of course ubiquitous in certain systems, it's basically everywhere, right? And it helps plants to resist uh, a uh, different uh, environmental stress. So here, uh, it's not my, my work, but uh, beautiful uh, mandibles, right? Teeth of uh, larvae, I don't know the species, they are very, very uh, deteriorated uh, because this one fed on the silicon enriched plant. So same species, but this plant has been fertilized with silicon before the, the, the larvae uh, eaten it. Uh, so yeah, so this is why uh, I, I don't know on that. So, oh, that's good. Anyway. Uh, should be. Um, so, I guess the most convincing explanation we have now to understand plant silicon variation that is at least uh, huge, but almost not detected to more than 10% in some species. So, if you have 10% of silicon, it can be of up to 20% of silica fibers, right? So, this is very huge. And I guess the most convincing uh, explanation we have is the phylogenetic one. Uh, we already talked about it this morning. So this is a very famous paper by Martin Hudson. So here we have plant orders, and to very, very schematically speaking, the poalis orders in which you have the poaceae, the cyperaceae, and, and so on, they tend to accumulate more silica. Uh, just to show species, so you have this myrtacid, this is eucalyptus species, a very important species in Australia that do not accumulate silicon at all in the myrtacid family for some reasons. And here you have orsades, one of the most silicon accumulated species we have out there. So, uh, to understand this phylogenetic control, uh, looks like, uh, looks like uh, molecular biology can have some answer. Um, and especially the fact that uh, it seems to have a matter of, it seems to be a matter of active versus uh, passive transport. So Japanese really started to work on that with, with rice uh, at early, early 20s. And they showed that, yes, currently there is a system of active silicon transport. For now, they, they speak about three or four active silicon transporters. So it means that silicon uptake is not only passive, not only driven by transpiration. And it also kind of explains the phylogenetic background that we are seeing in uh, today's plant silicon distribution. Just for another uh, perspective on the matter, you have this paper of Christopher Exley. Uh, this guy, well, uh, the guy I just talked about, yeah, we disagree on quite a lot of stuff. And uh, including the fact that active silicon transporters are really a thing. For Christopher Exley, we can't call them transporters, and they are not specific to silicon. So, but that's really another topic, but at least I just if you wish to check that. And uh, that's weird because the, yeah, not supposed to be all the police, all the type of the chain. Anyway. So maybe to better understand cities, plant silicon variation, we can uh, take a look to the evolutionary perspective, right? So we have this very cool paper from uh, Caroline Stromberg in functional ecology. So they basically try to find some matches between the uh, emergence of uh, high silicification in plants and specific uh, temporal events uh, during the course of evolution. So silicon is a defense against herbivores and pathogens, at least in some case, right? So let's check if we have a grass grazer co-evolution hypothesis. Silicon can mitigate water stress in some situations. Maybe we'll have some talks about that later. Let's check if silicification emerged mostly during periods of aridity. And finally, silicon can be used as a substitute for carbon in cell wall. This is not crystal clear, we'll come back to that later, but there is also this idea in the literature that silicon could actually be substitute for carbon, and then when CO2 was scarce, during low CO2 uh, atmosphere period, uh, silicification has been like favored. So they basically try that, and they conclude that it's quite hard to find a match uh, between these events and the uh, potential evolution of uh, silicification. 
So again, I guess we are still with this question. Why do one six five is not uh, distinctive? Mm. So I guess another way to see it, and this is really why I, I wanted to try to go in the trade-based ecology lab with uh, my my postdoc, is also to use a trade-based comparative approaches, right? So you studying different species with different functional traits. And maybe we can, uh, with this kind of method, in a way, or approach at least, uh, identify, uh, I don't know, um, evolutionary constraints on silicification. And we can maybe see repeated patterns to really uh, understand uh, why, why the plant is fine and how the plants use uh, this uh, sediment. So to do that, I, uh, we built a database with silicon concentration. So this is not phytolytic concentration, right? But I, I guess this is always this. Silicon concentration versus phytolytic concentration. Is it the same stuff? Are we speaking the same language? But this is exciting. Maybe to speak about that later. But yeah, here this is really like silicon bulk leaf silicon concentration at the organ scale. And I do this database by using different uh, papers, already published papers. And I uh, crossed it with a try and go straight. So there are basically uh, two main big trade based uh, databases that are uh, very like, popular these days. Uh, to extract specific functional traits and to add these traits to my silicon database. And the object I, the objective were to what is the interspecific relation with silicon concentration and whether leaf silicon concentration would articulate with a major trait based ecological frameworks. So, very quickly, uh, so this is the first result from this database. So, we saw it was not a rocket science, it was expected, but still cool to see a lot of species. Uh, so it just compared to the Martin Olson database, it's uh, three times uh, more. We have three, three, three times more species. So each dot is a species, and yes, we found that non-woody species they tend to accumulate, uh, they tend to accumulate more silicon than woody species. So it was kind of expected, I guess. Uh, even though you can see actually quite big overlap between the two groups, uh, which is also exciting. Exciting. So one of the one of these overlap points is this tropical tree. So it's definitely a woody species. For some reason, it has this huge silicon concentration, uh, 12 percent. Uh, I don't know if somebody can help me to pronounce its name. That's very weird if I love this species. But maybe one day I will be able to pronounce it. Uh, so yeah, this is a tree, and yet it accumulates a lot of silicon. And on the other hand, this is a monocot from a uh, PhD in Australia. So you can think that we have a high silicon concentration, and yet it didn't. Very low silicon concentration. So this overlap is uh, quite interesting. Too. So I've tried, first of all, to put, to add silicon uh, in the global spectrum of plant form and function. So the global spectrum of plant form and function is this very famous uh, paper that was, uh, that has been a big, big thing in trade-based ecology. So it's basically a big PCA, right? And you have 45,000 species. Each dot is a species. And there are several traits. And they basically show that, yes, you have this plant size axis on which you have the seed mass, the plant height, a specific stem density, and on the other, uh, other, you have another axis of leaf nitrogen concentration and leaf mass per area. So LMA is basically how tough, how strong is your leaf, it's the leaf mass per area. So this is the global spectrum of plant form and function, and my idea was to add silicon to that, to, 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 to see what, what it was expressed. And we basically showed that uh, it was, again, quite expected because we are still comparing woody and non-woody species, but silicon was actually very well represented on this spectrum. It was perfectly opposed to seed mass plant high and specific stem density on this uh, functional space, meaning that, yes, small species, at least non-woody species, they tend to accumulate much more silicon compared to tall species. So yeah, silicon is well represented on this global spectrum, at least when you compare, when you compare uh, apple and oranges. So after that, I tried to put silicon on the leaf economic spectrum. So this uh, is all the kind of trade-based uh, ecological frameworks, uh, important papers uh, published uh, almost 20 years ago now. And it basically showed that with six major leaf traits that are perfectly correlated to each other worldwide, and it basically show you a kind of global trade-off between two different ecological strategies. On the one hand, you have fast-growing species, but they are soft in a way. They are not very, uh, very well uh, uh, defended against stress. So, and also they are uh, leaves that live for a very short, short period of time. So all the basically the cycle is very quick. And on the other side of the spectrum, you have these tough species that are very slow-growing species. 
low nutrient concentration, low photosynthetic waste, and so on. So silicon is actually a defense, right? I mean, this is mostly how we present it. So we could expect to have silicon on this side of the spectrum. Like that conservative species, they will tend to have more silicon. Mm -hmm. So when I tried that in the same PCI, I basically find that silicon was here, completely independent to the global, uh, to the leaf economic spectrum. So here we have the slow growing species, fast growing species, but soft, and silicon was uh, not correlated to, to that. But in this PCI, you have woody and non woody species. And after that, I tried to do the same only with non woody species. And when you do that, you actually see that leaf silicon is very well correlated with leaf master area, leaf dry master dry matter content, which is basically your fiber tissues and the density of your leaf, and negatively correlated to leaf phosphorus, nitrogen, photosynthetic rates. And not correlated to the plant size gradient, right? This time it was silicon was not a matter of plant height or whatever, because I am within the non woody species. So it could mean that silicon, yes, it evolved as a conservative trait, or at least as a trait uh, that can be used to better resist stress. Uh, and, uh, and then in, in more slow growing species. So this is at least what we can do. Uh, I guess another way to also uh, do this kind of trade based approaches is also to go back at the intra specific level. Sometimes it can be more powerful. Um, so I also try to do that with rice. So this is 50 genotypes of uh, rice, and I basically try to do uh, the same kind of uh, analysis. And uh, this time it was uh, so here you have this kind of axis with leaf nitrogen phosphorus, the relative growth rate, so you have fast growing genotypes here, and here you have slow growing genotypes, and we found that actually silicon again was not very related to that, and it was negatively correlated to the leaf dry matter content, so I, actually we don't know, here they will see the negative correlation between the two traits. Uh, it could mean, for some reasons, that you could have a kind of trade-off between leaf dry matter content and leaf silicon, silicification. Maybe some genotypes, they tend to accumulate more in sterile tissues, in fibers, so they are denser leaves, and others that decide in a way, or at least they invest more in a silicification to achieve similar functions. But this is, uh, I guess, still a hypothesis. And during my, uh, my postdoc, we actually find the same. We find this negative relation between leaf silicon and leaf master area that also tend to suggest that, yes, uh, you have this kind of trade off between. Uh, morphological, leaf morphological traits and silicification to achieve similar, uh, similar goals. Uh, this is different, but it's also quite cool. I wanted to, wanted to show that, just that. So this is the leaf arc. We found that silicon concentration was actually very well correlated to the leaf arc. So meaning that when you have high silicon concentration, your leaf is going to be straight. And when you have low silicon concentration, your leaf is going to be much less straight. So it was uh, quite, quite clear in this paper. So silicon is more expressed in non woody species, uh, but still some exceptions. So that's why it's expressed on the fourth dimension of the global spectrum. In terms of cost and leaf economic spectrum, whether silicon is more about resource acquisition, resource conservation, looks like silicification, at least for non woody species, could be seen as a conservative trait. And finally, looks like the, yeah, that's weird. Uh, looks like silicon uh, could be related to some specific morphological uh, traits. So very quickly, I also wanted to show that. So there is a big stuff in the literature about silicon is this matter of trade-off with carbon and carbon-based compounds. Maybe some of you have heard about it. Uh, and actually, we found the same in the database, but we are not the only one. There are several papers that show negative relation between leaf silicon concentration and leaf carbon concentration. And sometimes it's, tough, sometimes it's not leaf carbon concentration, sometimes it's like lignin, cellulose, phenolic, so specific carbon-based impacts. So uh, I guess that's a, bit, uh, that's a bit weird because it could be sim simply dilution effect, right? If you have on a 100% basis, if you have more silicon, you have less carbon. So it could be only that. And, uh, but that's still puzzling. That's still quite interesting. Uh, so yeah, we found that with a lot of species in the database. And uh, to show what I'm doing now, to precisely try to better understand this kind of trade-off and how we can't use silicon, and especially the trade-off between silicon and carbon. I'm really combining uh, cryosem EDX, uh, so as such I can see where is silicon, so silicon is in green, for instance, and I can see where carbon is, so carbon is in purple, for instance, uh, here. So I'm using that to, yeah, for the silicon-carbon uh, uh, issues, 
And also to better understand, yeah, with Martin Anderson about uh, Rosa Maria talked about carbon that can be trapped uh, inside factory yeah. time. Also using these techniques with Martin Anderson to check uh, what's going on at the cell level. And since I also wanted to show these nice videos, I also, uh, yeah, I'm using, I'm combining these techniques with all the trade based approaches with micro CT scans. But as paleo scientists, I'm sure you know this technique. It's just super new to me, so I'm so excited. So yeah, you basically have this kind of 3D image of your leaf based on density. So basically, when you are white, it means that you are super dense. So it really shows that you have uh, this silica layer uh, in the epidermis, uh, just below the epidermis, and also in this kind of spikes uh, across the uh, this epidermis, basically. Just another way to visualize uh, my CT scan because I really looks, I, I, I really think they are really cool. So this is like the conical shape factories for those who know that well in cypheracy. Uh, so yeah, with this technique you can see. Uh, well, maybe I'm the only one to be amazed because you are very familiar with this technique. So I don't know, but yeah, you can. We, we even saw like this kind of cell wall silicification. So you can basically by like, playing with density, keeping only the silica. Uh, and I think this is quite good. Uh, and I guess I just wanted to finish with that. Yeah, thank you so much. So thank you, thank you so much for 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 this talk and also for the patience. <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah, uh, I in... maybe that's nice. <laughs> I, I really think it, it's amazing, like all the, all the things you are doing, also with the micro city. It, I, I was impressed. Can you put back the image? Um, so, in the last image on the bottom, this, these are the pythonids. So, in the last one, this one? Yes. yes. Well, uh, I guess we can have a chat about the definition of pythonids, but this is silica, for sure. Biogenic silica. So, and I, the biotinic silica, it's more concentrated. On the cell. This is the cell wall. Yeah, I know, I know that's a bit of, uh, that's not beautiful what I put here, right? So here you have basically three individuals, mm -hmm. three different species, and I just, so with this technique, it's basically um, give you a, a 3D image of your species based on density, just the density of what, uh, of, so, uh, deciding yourself whether it's CDC, uh, whether it's mineral or whether it's organic matter, it's uh, up to you, right? But I mean, okay. if you match that with cryosemidics, you are actually quite sure that yes, this is silica. But what is what is quite sure is that uh, I'm I'm quite convinced that you have a kind of degree in silicification. I'm quite convinced that you have these specific phytolites like yeah. conical shape. I'm sure they are the denser one um, because uh, they are very tightly controlled, I guess. And I guess all these cell wall deposits, they tend to be maybe less dense and they tend to dissolve much faster in soils. This is my, my, my hypothesis. You, you see what I mean? Yes. I, I really think that they have this degree in silicification and that not all factories do the same in soil because it's not yeah, the same degree that's of condensation. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, but yeah, I mean, uh, when when you remove all the blue that is supposed to be really about uh, lignin cellulose and starch and whatever, uh, yeah, it looks like it's mostly silica. I, I don't know where I'm going with this data, but I'm trying to combine that with trade based uh, trade based uh, approaches. And yeah, in this species, for instance, it was so cool to see that we saw this huge huge deposits in these cells. Uh, yeah. Could you could you go back one more slide to your to your SEM or what is the signal the silica signal? Uh, so under, yeah, so under, because... un, underneath the epidermis. So you yeah, underneath the epidermis. Yeah, I, I mean it's supposed to be this kind of outer. I mean, how, how do they call that? Outer uh, OTW silica layer. So it's just below the epidermis in the cell wall. And it's actually quite common to see that in rice, you see that as well. And actually, in all in all of my species, I have that. Sometimes I don't have in some species. So there are, I'm I'm only, I'm only working on sedges now, uh, cypress. Yeah. Sometimes I don't even have the this beautiful uh, conical shape factory. Sometimes they're just not here for some reasons. But 
all this kind of silica layer just below the epidermis is almost always always here. And I really think it's not very controlled. I mean, my feeling is that it's just a matter of transpiration. So uh, it's it's not a case that it's kind of in the like surrounding this the air pockets, like the substomarfal cavity and the spongy well, air spaces or you mean the, the this kind of the, uh, the, the one just below the epidermis? In the in the previous, sorry, I'm, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not explaining one. myself very well. Yeah, no, in the previous one. Uh, the only thing I know is that just below the epidermis, not like uh, not so really, not not below the epidermis, below the cuticle, right below the cuticle. Yeah. Right. I can show you more. Yeah, yeah, we did yeah. talk about it later. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually... <laughs> no, so sorry. No, no. I mean, it, this is more like a, a general question for you and for anyone to, because I'm really interested in this. Uh, is all silicon implants phytolates or is there silicon implants yeah, that yeah. is not in phytolates? Because I think that that's one of one of the main, uh, uh, at least for you know. Uh, uh, from what I understand from your talk, no matter the shape, as as long as it's preserved in soil and that it's silica, even if it's multi cells and quite of random deposits, you put that phytolates. Ah. Uh, at least all. Yeah, but it's more in the plant. So yeah. within the within the living plant, uh, yeah. is the silicon? Is there any silicon? Uh, what, so when, when you analyze uh, chemicals, oh yeah, yeah. A, a tissue. Well, you, you can have a dissolved silicon, still still a monosilicic acid within the plant just before polymerization. It can be dissolved. Okay. But quickly it will it will start to polymerize to form biogenic silica. I know there are there are very recent papers that are. I don't think it's crystal clear. I think it's quite a uh, bit yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, quite debated, but it looks like silicon could silicon oxygen carbon bonds apparently it could exist. So silicon could also cross-link lignin. So it would be a kind of organic silicon, but it's uh, I mean my understanding is that most of the silicon in plants is silica, right? It's, it's biogenic silica yeah. with with water, carbon, and a few elements, but yeah. Yeah, and phytolysis yeah. not only opal, they have all Oh, yeah, and there was stuff yeah, yeah. side, but, mm. but yeah, this is, yeah, you don't have organic silicon, you don't have any other, it's much less uh, versatile than carbon. This is yeah. why I guess we are, we have not uh, selected, uh, we have not a silicon base that way. <laughs> I guess we know that there's some deposition of biosilica even outside of the cell. That we also call sometimes when you see, when we see like slight intercellular yeah. Uh, yeah. carbon, eh, yeah. carbon, sorry, uh, biosilica deposit. So I think there is also some deposition of uh, silicic acid that happened to precipitate into biosilica even outside cells. And so since it's outside cells, it's difficult to call it finally. But I guess that, yeah, I guess. Well, yeah, like it's it. where we like yeah, the you, can, you can see, even if it's not the cell, you can see it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess it's just a matter of terminology because if you take from the Greek, phytolith just yeah. uh, some rocks and plants, okay. it can be anywhere, it can be anything, I don't think it's in the right? But, yeah. but uh, I don't think it's crystal clear in the literature, actually. No, no. no. I think no. people use phytolith quite differently. Sometimes in paper, I see people saying phytolith. And in mind, they really have the dumbbell shape, I call it the conical shape, or the one you are using in bioscience. But all these discrete, weird deposits that are going to quickly dissolve, in their mind, these, these are not phytolites. I know that for some soil scientists, biogeochemists, this is their view. I, I'm quite sure of that. So, no, I don't think it's clear. But maybe it's just a matter of terminology. Yeah, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that there's like, it depends on what you are doing and question you are asking yeah. to yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you are interested, for example, to uh, because before you were talking about uh, silica absorption, quantity of biosilica absorbed by the plants and genetically, the genetically control of the absorption. So maybe if you are interested on looking on this, maybe you have to take a look even on outside cell deposits and yeah, yeah. if you are like more interested on maybe uh cytolite deposition into the cell wall uh, or the lumen maybe yeah, it's not so much important. I don't know if you know 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.
they started to cultivate to for agriculture purpose. So I'm going to to not to explain too much about these phytholith uh, characteristics, only to say that many times we're talking about mostly in archaeological and archaeological environment about these ecological patterns that or conditions that can affect this phytholith production and morphology. But also there are uh, another genetic patterns that most most of the times in archaeology are, are not uh, taken into account. These ones are the periodic level, this gene expression, and this cell preferential selection for silification. So we want to do it to integrate this information also in the building of reference collections to try to see if there is any information, anything, or any trait that can give us more uh, resolution in potential taxonomical attributions. So the role and effects of polyploidy, this is specific in our case for plants that we are going to do. It like Ploidy, first of all, expresses the number of complete sets of chromosomes in a biological set. When we talk about diploid, tetraploid, exaploid, that I'm going to talk about, it's about the number of sets of chromosomes that are homologous. This number of sets of chromosomes can be multiplied for, for example, this origin could be with the same species or also with hybridization. What uh, after that, what we have is a change in the level of ploidy, and also we can see uh, differences in morphological traits. These differences mm, are given by these events of uh, polyploid that can uh, give new species and also new morphological traits that can give to these plants uh, another traits to better adapt to different environments or maybe more uh, interest for people for consuming. So here, for example. There are two pictures. The first one is to show in triticum how the morphology of the, of the inflorescence change between in different levels of ploidy. We have the diploids with the small ones, more tiny um, inflorescence. And then when we are changing the level of ploidy to higher levels like tetraploid, hexaploid, we see a bigger one inflorescence. This also has an interest for human populations and for the selection of which species they are going to use for agriculture, for consumption, etc. Then um, when we when we go to the reference stuff with the bibliography of all the classification and phylogeny of plants, we see many of um, different uh, discussions about the way to uh, classify the different species, subspecies, the different groups of plants. Due to these hybridizations, these polyploid events, it's very difficult. It's a very complex environment of different species that we have. Also here, I, I put a table that only show the most common sections, species and subspecies of triticum. There are several, several more species. And also then we have some variants that are more endemic, more local uh, from local places that puts also more complexity to define exactly which species. So first of all, we know because it had been explained in other um, presentations that in phytholids, we still have some Maybe it's not limitations, maybe it's lack of knowledge to be able to do an attribution of this phytholith to a taxonomic or uh, uh, to a specific species or family or group. But also in the proper classification, phylogenetic classification of plants, it's a complex, a complex scenario to always to define the differences between some of these uh, specimens because they're very related. There are many several hybridizations, events of polyploidy. Here also on the right, we see that, for example, to show, to point out to the triticum estibum, the bread width, that it's like one of the most common, we see all this pathway that has been following to arrive from these not also wild species, because here there are two different things, are the wild and domesticated species, but are also these changes in the level of ploidy, these genetic events that also happens. These events can be from autopolyploidy, could be for hybridization from triticum species. Also, we have hybridization with aegilops and other species. So we have a kind of mix that it's also difficult. So we are trying to develop tools for phytholids to do an attribution to a, 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 to a specific species. But also we have to be clear on what are we going to follow in this attribution. We need to understand, to read a lot about the phylogenic and the nowadays actual classification. One of the interesting things is that 
this on in all this complex and mixing uh, scenario, the three different species and superspecies are well divided in boxes, in big boxes called sections. These sections are monococcum, dicocoidea, and triticum. These sections are divided by the level of ploidy. So instead of uh, going to the last step to be able to say uh, this phytholith or this uh, arrangement of phytholiths come from this specific subspecies or variant, I think that we should first go step by step. And the first step is to be able to discriminate phytholiths from these different sections. And for, exa for example, in, in an archaeological profile, it would be very interesting to know that if this arrangement of phytholiths came from a exaploid or tetraploid species, because it means that there are some species that cannot be, and we can delete it. And also, maybe depending on which areas, we know the distribution of these species, and also we are going deeper, and deeper, and deeper, and, and more closely to the uh, species that uh, which we are working on. For this reason, uh, so we are working on the on the site of Tel Shimrom in the north of Israel. We are going to focus in Triticum because also we have some preliminary results from macrobotanical remains that give us some information of the species that they were they were found there. We try to follow this triticum uh, phylogeny to select some key species to this study of uh, ploidy and phytholic production to the autonomical attribution. And here there is the representation of the wet species that we selected from the Israeli gem bank that are uh, triticum monococcum from the diploid section. From the tetraploid section, there are several, several species, and we choose a three one, three uh, subspecies dicocoides, that is the wild and uh, species of the domesticated one that is dicocum, and subspecies durum, that was, it's the pasta wheat, that it's also very, very used. And then in the, the last one is the triticum maestibum exaploid. Why am choosing also barley, because we have also uh, evidences of the presence of barley. And we will talk later how not only ploidy could affect this phytolic production, also it has been demonstrated that the domestication events can affect these ploidy uh, differences. So for this reason, in the with uh, phylogeny, we select dicopoides and dicopum, because it's the wild and the domesticated one of the same level of ploidy. And also from Miley, we select the wild and the domesticated one with the same level of ploidy to see if there is any difference or not due to the ploidy and to the domestication stuff. Then uh, how we want to see the differences. We, in our experimental design, we try to limit that all the, um, all the potential uh, differences came from this ploidy level. So we try to control the conditions of growing, these ecological conditions, these ecological variables that we know, and it's been demonstrated, that affect this phytholic production. When I mean phytholic production, I mean if it, they are produced or not, in which quantities, in which morphologies, and which type of morphology, and in which places of the plant. It's the whole package of everything. So we, usually, the tools that we have for uh, research in archaeological samples, it's to build this reference uh, of collection of modern analog analogs. And the procedure is to only to have these plants to identify and to extract the phytoliths. But we are many times missing these genetic patterns that affect this phytolith production. So we want to introduce to this reference collection. For this reason, we uh, germinate and we grow the seeds under controlled conditions. So we select a minimum of 10 seeds for each species for the germination step. We hydrated the seeds to uh, at the beginning, and then we put the seeds in a germinator with controlled conditions of humidity, uh, temperature, uh, hours of light, etc. After that, when they start to grow, we had the we saw that. Uh, we had a lack of space. So at the last step stage of this uh, growing, we have to move it outside of the germinator. And in the last steps of growing of these plants was only controlled the irrigation stuff because it, it was in a greenhouse, but we uh, controlled only the water uh, amount that we were putting to the plants. Bef uh, we wait 
uh, until the whole uh, development of, of the plan. And then we took it before the decay of these plants. We took this uh, uh, vegetal material, we dried at the oven, and then we start to proceed to analyze different kinds of things. First of all, um, as we want to introduce the knowledge of uh, this ploidy stuff, this cytogenetics for archaeological issues, I went to the uh, Botanical Institute of Barcelona to learn how to estimate the gen, um, the gen contact and the ploidy level of each species. Because in our case, we know it from the Israeli gen bank. But in the future, we want to apply in the selection of plants that usually uh, we, we do around the archaeological sites. Most of the times are some subspecies or variants that it's not clear in which group they could be. And with the ploidy level, we can attribute to one of these sections, if it's monococoidea, dicocoidea, or triticum. So what uh, the procedure that we follow, which they published for PGC and NATE. And what we do is, with, first of all, we need a reference standard, which the ploidy level and the genome says it's known. In this case, we used two different reference standards, petroselinum leaves and pisum sativa leaves that both are deployed. And we compare with, uh, uh, with our target plan. We did it at a minimum of three specimens for each species that we were growing at the Botanical Institute. So the first of all is to cut the vegetal tissue and then to stain with a fluorochrome. The way the flow citrometry works is that with this fluorochrome binds to the uh, genetic content of the cell of the nuclei. And we put it on the flow cytometry and we have an, a quantitative approach of the how many, uh, which is the quantity of genome that we have on each cell. And, this, and that compared with our reference standard, we can estimate if we are uh, working with a diploid, tetraploid, or hexaploid uh, species. Here there is two examples of two of the plants. The first one on the left is the triticum monococcum. We know it's diploid. Also here, the two uh, uh, peaks, the blue peaks, are very close. So it means that they are at the same level of ploidy. They are not at the same uh, place because they are two different species. We are comparing with a reference one, but one it's here, it was pisum and also triticum. And on the right, we have a triticum decocum that we know is tetraploid, that we know that we see that it's more than two times the our reference standard of the genome size. So from this information, we can infer that we have working with a variant of triticum monococcum of diploid and with a triticum decocum that it's tetraploid. Also, in many cases, um, when we uh, try to develop some tools, we only uh, think about the publication and not to the application to the all the discipline all the stuff. And so we want, we want to apply all this uh, ploidy uh, information to archaeological reference collections, maybe not all the archaeological groups, they have a flow cytometer. It could be more difficult, but there are other ways, other protocols to measure the level of ploidy. This one is quite easier and it's the chromosome counting. And what we need to do, it's only to take a small fraction of the roof. Why the roof? Because the roof is a meristem, it's a vegetal tissue that it's, um, the cells are dividing a lot all, uh, many times and chromosomes are not always present in this form, in this morphology in the cells. They are only present in the cells when they are going to divide in the metaphase stage. So the roof is a tissue where we have a high probability to find cells in a, in a metaphase stage where the, the chromosomes are visible and we can count it. Also, we need something to, to color these uh, chromosomes. And we applied a safranin that means the, the DNA. So we stain the, our roof, we cut the roof, and then we apply temperature and acid to break the vegetal tissue. And in the end, we mount a slide at the optical microscope. We can find if one of these cells, there are the chromosomes form, and we can count of them. Here, it's the case for Mordeum spontaneum. We can count and there is 40. 40, if you go to allelography, it's the diploid stage. It's a uh, diploid species. So it means that there are two entire pair sets of homologous chromosomes. It's another way to count it. Also here, it's important to have these remainings of the cell. I, I don't know if you can be, you can see it on your screen, but around this uh, 
14 chromosomes, you can see the remainings of the cell that was containing this, all this uh, genetic material. So after that, why we are doing this? Why, why we are going into deep in the ploidy? First of all, because of we have we, uh, we have evidences that polyploidization has an immediate effect on plant morphology via enlarged cell size. As, as taught before, phytholids are produced inside of cells. They take the form and also the size of the morphology and the size of the vegetal tissue, the cells of the vegetal tissue they are produced. So it means that if we have a difference in these vegetal tissues, could be a potential difference in phytholid production, we will see. Also, we have uh, some previous uh, uh, works about ploidy um, and phytholid production. We have this stuff from 1993 that says that three to measurements of phytholid sites typically increase with ploidy. But also we have another uh, study that says that domestication of diploid badly will reduce this phytholid size. So oh, we are working in, in agriculture. We want to know which species that we're using and when. We have several uh, processes. Some of them are genetic processes, events, others are, for example, domestication practice. And we have that two uh, potential source of variability in phytholid uh, production. So we want to know what's going on there. So for this reason, this is the um, the pathway that we want to, to follow to create, as always, this modern analogous reference collection because this is a tool to improve our taxonomical uh, attribution. We want to estimate the ploidy level of the species or, or the varieties that we are working around the archaeological site to try to uh, arrive to the first stage of this attribution. Then we want to apply these morphometrics because we, we know that polyploidization affects cell size. Also, we know that um, measurements of phytholids in triticum will increase with ploidy. And then we want to uh, go deeper in this taxonomical attribution inside each of the triticum section. And in the end, all of this is to apply in archaeological samples, in our case, in Tershinko. So um, now we want to not to reduce our reference collection of modern analogs only to see the phytholids and extraction protocol. We want to apply also this knowledge of the ploidy level to know which section we are. Also, we want to apply these morphometrics to measure the potential differences in phytholid size and uh, morphology in, in the different uh, phytholids. And then we are going to apply segmentation stuff, deep learning tools that will give us not only an automatic uh, tool to identify and uh, which kind of morphologies, also to find uh, these small patterns, traits that are related to maybe only one group subspecies or species of criticum. So our future perspective with all of this work, it's from the reference collection and these ploidy studies, apply morphometry, then to apply the this deep learning to create a big image database to be able to do image classification, and then to apply the intention run from the phytholite attribution to see in the different um, um, in the profile of, because uh, Telchim Ron, it's an uh, archaeological site with a long chronology with uh, of a lot of periods of occupation. So we want to see the differences between different periods and applying all this uh, work. Here are the references. Also, I would like to I would like to thank you, Botanical Institute of Barcelona, because we were able to use their laboratory the germinator of the greenhouse for the growing under controlled conditions of the our reference collection material. Also, Luke and Arnaud from Brussels for the guidance in deep learning and morphometrics, and the Israeli Gen Bank because they uh, gave us the seeds that of the treaty command or the species. And thank you for your attention. And if there is any questions. Thank you, Oriol. It was really an amazing talk, and I'm, I, 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 I really look forward to see all the the results coming out of this research. And if, if like, if we can say something, like, if there is a connection between, uh, uh morphology and ploidy, this is a, uh, this is really, uh, very important uh, for archaeology and not only. Uh, so I don't know. 
somebody has some question, I said that. <laughs> so there is a question in the chat. I don't know if you can read. Anyway, I can read it out loud. So Rotary, um, so Rotary is saying, I don't, uh, I'm not sure if it's graph, uh, if she graphed correctly, but before you mentioned the section of how to identify employee eleven. Uh, yes. Using information, okay, you can see. <laughs> yes, uh, there is a database of information about employee levels. It's also published by Yamaha uh, PGC. You can find it in Google Scholar. The problem is that, as always, it's not all published and not all species are known. For this reason, also, we wanted to check the employee levels of the subspecies and the varieties that we have. Depending in which species you are going to work, you will find that it's published. Depending of which species, not. For also, this is interesting to do for these subspecies and varieties to check the ploidy level and then to, to publish or to, to do this database. Also, many times it happens in a lot of disciplines that there is a lot of information, but not there is no integration of the information between disciplines or between groups. So it's not kind of, sometimes it's difficult to find it, but for triticum, it's quite easier than, than others. Uh, so there's another question from Kasma. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, with the modern analog reference collection, what what are the with, how do you choose your substrate and your growth conditions in your control experiment? And do you think that the substrate and light, for example, uh, have a, has an effect on on phytolith uh, deposition in your reference. The one of the big problems that we had, because always the the key thing is the um, the research design, and the key thing of the research design is to know the source of error or bias. We found that it was a huge amount of variables that can affect the phytolith production. I'm telling you that I controlled the variables because I knew which more uh, influent variables that we applied. But it's also true that we started to check that there are many, many things that, for, first of all, there is nothing published about all of these species, which intensity of light, number of hours of light, which kind of substrate is the better for phytolip production. This is not studied. But the problem is that to focus what I'm going to do. I'll try to control a little bit the variables of growing to focus on the uh, genetic on the ploidy stuff. But we started to check and, and also my supervisors told me, you need to focus because you are not going to finish uh, never. So, <laughs> we, so it's kind of, we started like, because instead of 12 hours of light in the geminator, why we do not put 10? Or why we not put nine? Or why we not put our 10? So, the the academic staff of my department they say you need to present your PhD in two years so we will focus mm -hmm. to try to control the most important variables and the important thing is when we are going to publish this to say the controlled variables are this and the results that we have are for these controlled variables yeah. so it means that if another wants to get the same you should follow these variables maybe if another one want to study which are the best growing conditions or how these growing conditions affect this ecological stuff. So it's more PhDs to come or postdocs or something like this. I don't, don't know if I'm answering you. That's right. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, okay. I think we can move on to the next one. Uh, so can you, uh, can you stop sharing the, the three? <laughs> Ah, uh, the, 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 the
Okay, sorry for the people online. Again, um, we are having some issues this morning. It's it's yeah. like this. It's it's really nice, nice, but we will be able to do that. <laughs> you all work in the uh, or yes. okay. 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 So you're all in the same group. It's the deck, deck on <laughs> so I think my previous uh, USB is playing for everything. <laughs> um, it's on the strikes. Student strike. Sorry, I on. Um, so thank you very much for, for having me here. Uh, I've had too much coffee already, so apologies if I speak too fast. Um, I'm going to be changing tack a little bit because this is not really about silica or phytolytes, uh, but more about the work I'm doing with my colleagues at Q and collaborators around the world uh, about how we confront climate change and go forward with new crops or old crops with novel adaptations. Um, to face, yeah, modern problems. Um, but of course, these modern problems are not new. You know, there's, there's ancient droughts and floods and everything. So it's just, you know, a lot about you know, context. Anyway, what we do have is anthropogenic, very highly speeded up uh, climate issues, uh, largely due to obviously the very high levels of CO2 that we're pumping into the atmosphere and the increased heat stress, much uh, of what we're experiencing uh, today. But on top of that, we've got a human population that's very much undergoing urbanization um, and a requirement for more food, uh, but an ongoing a lack of acceptance that we are growing the wrong crops in the wrong places because that's what we want to eat and that's what's driving international trade and market prices, etc. etc. But the consequence of this, all of this, is that we're having massive yield reductions uh, and we're already experiencing this and we will continue to experience this if we don't change from business as usual. So this is just a few examples uh, of this over the last couple of years or three years um, or decade, wherever you like to see 
It's a very similar picture throughout. Um, and as you know, in, in Spain and in Catalonia, we've got an issue here and you can't escape to the Pyrenees because it's going to be hot in there too. Um, so we've got to do something about it. We've got to grow different things in different ways uh, if we want to uh, keep eating what we want to eat. My background is not climate. My background is molecular genetics of plants, particularly stomata, so guard cell physiology, uh, stomatal development, and the evolution of stomata from the very earliest uh, plants that came onto the land all the way to the present day. So my interest is, is quite kind of big, large scale, if you like, both in terms of time scales. So this is a, a thermal image, and you see here two sporophytes of a particular moss called uh, Funaria hygrometrica, a very common uh, moss. And you can see that it's undergoing evaporative cooling in those deep blue areas on the base of the sporophyte. And that is where we have the stomata of the moss. And that evaporative cooling process happens in the mosses, just like it happens in our trees and in our crops. So stomata pretty much drive this mass flow from the uh, hydrosphere, sorry, the, 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 the soil environment, um, all the way to the atmosphere. So, so what you have is this water potential gradient that's being pulled up uh, and therefore stomata control this water loss, as well as so many other aspects of plant life, such as nutrient accumulation, carbon dioxide uptake from the air for driving photosynthesis, I've mentioned evaporation, uh, transportive cooling, but also pathogen responses, because these are the portals in the leaf, on the leaf, that are like the first port of call, if you like, to uh, microbes, the air, fungi, bacteria, viruses can enter and do enter through the guard cell port stomach. And of course, they are involved either passively or actively in silicon transport and uh, densification. So I mentioned smart physiology. Smart physiology is a short-term response. So this is opening and closing of the pore. Uh, and this happens over minutes, hours. And then there's the long-term developmental uh, response of the plant by manipulating its own leaf. Uh, oh. Sure. Yeah. So manipulating leaf stomachal traits. So that's stomachal density, stomachal size, and that kind of thing. Oops. So I won't talk about the molecular genetics or the physiology much today, but what I do as part of my work is use genes involved in stomach development and stomach physiology to mess about with the plant, to find out what they do, and to try to improve their water use efficiency uh, and other traits. So this is just an example of what we've done in soybean, uh, and this is using a peptide that's naturally occurring uh, peptide that is involved in uh, stomatal development pathways. So if you have more of this peptide, you have fewer stomata, if you have less of this peptide, you have more stomata. And then we can do this artificially by overexpressing the peptide, uh, the transcript of the peptide, and therefore you reduce stomatal density and you reduce stomatal conductance because you have a lower stomatal density uh, that therefore reduces water loss and improves uh, water deficit, stress, resilience, drought, resilience. 
So we can change some other traits on our stable props, and we can also choose different props that have specific Samarth traits. So I'll be talking about the second bit, about choosing new props with optimal traits for new clients. I'll talk about that in more detail here. And Jess Dunn uh, did a lot of this work on monetary and physiology. So my background is also in legumes, more than in monocots. Uh, more than in, in cereals, but I have worked on, on rice and I'm also working on uh, phonio millet now at Q. Uh, but I'll first talk about legumes, particularly beans, because uh, that's a lot of the, pro the work and projects I've been doing with collaborators in Mexico over the past eight years. Um, so, beans. There's many different species. You have New World beans like the Bacillus, uh, Bacillus vulgaris, Bacillus vaccinius, um, your Dima bean, your common bean, etc., etc. Um, runner bean, and then you've got your Old World beans like Vigna radiata, Vigna unguiculata, so cowpea, azuki bean. Uh, so many, there's so many beans, and then you've got soy, which I mentioned just now. But in the context of Bacillus, so, so, so your genus from the New World, they are a major global food crop, uh, not just in the Americas where they evolved, uh, but also particularly in, in Africa, in East Africa, uh, where they're grown a lot um, and they have kind of supplanted other uh, more traditional crops over the last few hundred years. But their flowers and their pots are very sensitive to heat stress, to drought stress, and therefore to climate change. And drought causes major yield losses in, uh, in, in many farming systems across the world. Now, the problem with legumes as a whole is that they have not been given the same attention as many of our kind of staple crops like rice, maize, uh, barley. Etc. etc. And therefore, they're, they're kind of lagging behind in breeding. And we need to increase that attention to improve their climate resilience. And then this is just a, a similar story that I was saying before: historical bean yields, future bean yields. If we don't change the things we grow and how we grow them, and then if we adapt our germplasm to uh, heat stress, drought stress tolerance, we could kind of ameliorate that. So Mexico is a beautiful country. It's also a center of mega agro biodiversity. It's also a center of mega biodiversity, whether you say that's wild species of plants or wild animals or, or whatever. But it's also a mega agro biodiversity hotspot. We've got lots of crop wild relatives. And it's the center of domestication. So many of the, the foods we eat now and grow across the world. So the beans, the Fasciolus genus, probably evolved in what is now modern Chiapas, modern uh, Guatemala. And this, this is really hot, humid, tropical rainforest. Um, and then we should I say humans domesticated Bacillus vulgaris, a common bean, in what is probably now Oaxaca. So it's much more seasonal and dry in the forest. So that already gives an evolutionary perspective to just this particular species. Um, and we can compare that to the other species and other uh, non domesticated forms as well. Another species is tepari. So the tepari bean is Fasciolus epitifolius. This is a desert adapted bean. It's uh, slightly smaller, seed size. It evolved uh, in the north and was domesticated in the north, um, particularly in, in high, you know, arid uh, Chihuahua desert, Samoa desert. And it's really drought tolerant, heat tolerant, salt tolerant. And it's still 
know, used a lot today and has in fact been used a lot by uh, breeders to uh, bring in those traits to common being. So this is an example of using that diversity to, to improve the resilience of what we eat. So you can see there's big differences between the origins and the trajectories just between these two species. And you'll see similar stories between rock wild relatives and you name two species closely related, there'll be that diversity to draw on. So to look at this uh, with, with a postdoc, Dr. Claudia Lowe, we're using this FIGS approach. So I'll talk about this a few, in a few different contexts, but here we're talking about fasciolus FIGS, focused identification of germ plasma strategy. So essentially, there are loads of gene banks around the world. Okay? They have so much germplasm, so many accessions, so many different species. How do we find the traits that we're interested in for particular environments, particular climates, uh, etc.? One way to do this is through fix. So you can, as long as you've got the georeference, the coordinates of that collection, so you know where it came from, you can use that georeference in this model to kind of predict what it may. Uh, what traits it may have in terms of whatever climate uh, thing, so heat, drought, uh, salt, uh, etc. So Claudia has been doing this with Vasiolus, and you see all the species here across the Americas, and she's been screening thousands of accessions essentially, but just using these coordinates and the climate models. So you again identify what we should be looking at. And then another approach, which is completely the opposite, is looking at one species, mutations within that one species, and phenotypes. So here we're using thermal imaging again. You see a common bean seedling, these two primary leaves, and you're identifying hot and cold mutants through that screen. So you can go from phenotype to genotype. So once you see, for example, in the top, you see that really hot mutant, and at the bottom, you see that really cold mutant blue. Why is that happening? Well, if we know that that's the mutant, you can do whole genome sequencing and go straight to hopefully which uh, polymorphisms are in there that, that could be candidate genes of interest. We're doing that with colleagues in UNAM in Mexico. And then, you know, how is that going to be translated to uh, field? Well, this is where we need the input of farmers and what they grow, what they used to grow in different places and, and how they're adapted to climate change. So this is something, again, is outside of my skill set. So Justin Moat is much more uh, spatial analysis and big climate models again. And then uh, Dr. Talia Martinez uh, in, in Ipicit in Mexico, she is an anthropologist and archaeologist uh, who works with communities in northern Mexico, understanding and seeing how they adapt to their area, their land, what crops they used to use and now use. So we're comparing elite varieties of bean, squash, maize in the traditional agricultural setting with their land races that they're used to growing and the particular areas. So what grows best where and, and, and what can we do about that? So this involves kind of participatory research as well as the climate niche modeling, what will happen in the future and how can we prepare for it, uh, as well as experimental designs in the field, so using their uh, crops in situ and comparing yields, etc, etc. So that's the beans, and now I'll quickly change tack to another project uh, that we're working on, which is more about kind of de novo domestication, neo-domestication. And when I say domestication, I mean a uh, 
conception of, of crop. So, for example, you could argue that Vigna and Bellata and Deuteria are fully domesticated species and have been domesticated thousands of years ago. But I argue that even our modern crops that we're breeding and growing in the field now are still undergoing a continuous domestication, right? So what I'm interested in is what we can do to these crops and to crop wild relatives to improve them for farmer acceptance, consumer acceptance, and yield under these extreme environments. And we're doing this as just an example on three species, uh, Vigna umbellata, uh, which is rice bean, very tiny uh, bean from, from East and Southeast Asia, Digitaria exilis, which is phonio millet, uh, and C4 grass, and then Diascoria from Madagascar. So what we want are species and varieties that have lower input requirements. You know, we don't want to be putting loads of fertilizer on the field, relying on you know, water if there's no water forthcoming. So which crops offer advantages and what doesn't? And this is just three, but there are so many others. For example, in Vigna, Apalata, sorry, in Vigna, you've also got uh, Cowpea, cowpea is an excellent uh, crop uh, for dry and arid hot zones, but also Bambara groundnut. So that's Vigna subterranea, grows a bit like peanut, extremely drought resilient, tolerant. So this is just a few. And rice bean working uh, in Tanzania uh, with, with the Nelson Mandela African Institute of Science Technology to identify what are the most resilient accessions and how can we improve them. And then back to Claudia's work, we're getting these accessions through Fix, trying to find where they come from, uh, whether they were collected, and what correlates with the hottest and driest sites, and then testing that either in controlled environments or in the field. Now, Similarly, uh, we want to know what we can change, and Vigna is luckily uh, a well-studied genus, um, and there are various Vigna genomes out there, including uh, the rice bean itself, and so we can kind of target particular traits and their underlying gene candidates to modify those traits, either through gene editing or through traditional crossing, etc. So going on to Phonio, Phonio, again, there are many land races. The ones we're working on are from Guinea, but Senegal, Ghana have got excellent uh, drought resilient, and Mali as well, very heat tolerant uh, accessions. And we want high yielding plants that have long growth. Um, and so what I should say also is this is PhD project, uh, this time with Sari and uh, KNUST in, uh, uh, in Ghana, and again, very similar to rice bean approach. What do we want to change? Again, farmers, you know, if you don't have the farmers on board, you don't know if we're doing the right thing. We want to know what they find most difficult, and it often is the case that small grain size, shattering, like seed shattering and scattering, uh, before harvesting, and then you mentioned husking earlier, difficulty de-husking is also a, a, a big problem. So thankfully, there are uh, Digitaria genomes, again, Phonio is, is just recently published. We can use that genetic data to identify the gene candidates that could be of use to improve on these accessions that are the most drought to the end of tolerant. And we're doing this with with NIAD in Cambridge, and it's formed the basis of the PhD project of George Burt at Kew. So Malagasy yams is a slightly different story. These yams are essentially always wild harvested. So these are probably not 
domesticated in the sense that they've never been taken from the wild into a cultivated setting. But they're heavily, uh, heavily harvested from the wild, and many species are now undergoing uh, extreme extinction risk. Um, so they're you know, very vulnerable to extinction. But what can we do to make these wild plants essentially cultivatable and much more uh, useful to Malagasy communities, Malagasy farmers for putting in a field and therefore reducing that risk of biodiversity loss in the wild. And this is something uh, we're doing with Q Madagascar Conservation Centre and the University of Antananarivo. Again, Claudia and her data sets are beautiful and we want to use the georeference data of these species to find where uh, the best potential lies for the torrents and the drought torrents. So there's so many unknowns because these are rare, rare yam species. And so right now, again, we need to know ploidy, we need to know genome size, chromosome number, all of those things. And we need to do full genome sequencing really to identify target uh, genes underlying traits. So this is the kind of most biggest unknowns, if you like, in this, in this project of three species. But what do farmers want? Well, lots of these plants will sprawl everywhere and they'll grow big. And that's not something really amenable to agriculture. So what we're thinking is, can we reduce plant size uh, to something like a bushy variety rather than a climbing variety? that could uh, help uh, in, in bringing these from the wild into the field. So I'm sorry, it's, it's been quite a judge from different topics, uh, but essentially I started from this kind of stomatal perspective. I'm very interested to hear your, your, uh, your take on the silica, because the phonio millet is, is a C4 grass that, that you know, has a lot of uh, phytoliths. Uh, I don't know much about those diastoria, but I know the beans as well have many phytoliths. Um, and I mentioned nodules because again, the low ground processes is something we're interested in. So that complex effect below ground and above ground in climate on top of the evolutionary background, domestication background, and the diversity that we've got to draw on, as well as obviously human culture and our needs uh, under climate change. So we've got lots to do, um, but hopefully we can try and start to fine tune these genetic molecular targets for our extreme, uh, our extreme climates that we're, that we're facing. And thank you very much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Cassie. It was great. Uh, really cool. Uh, so I just had this. So there are this kind of trade off sometimes between defense, stress resistance, growth for production. And why you are looking for genotypes or specific genes or phenotypes with. High water humidity, low somata conductance. Do you think, in some way, you also could select uh, genotypes, genotypes uh, with lower uh, growth rates or even lower uh, yield rates? And, and, and do you try to take that into account by measuring some other traits, not related to stress resistance, but also growth, to see whether you have this kind of trade off? Yeah, yeah there's definitely this trade off. So. We have both domesticated and in more recent years, in the past 100, 200 years, selected plants with very high stomatal conductance yeah. because they're very good yielders mm. as long as they've got water. <laughs> um, so there is this trade off. And so we will probably, as you know, for example, Folio Millet has got very small yields compared to other crops because it's got this lower conductance. 
Mm. Uh, so yeah, this is this is something that we've got to balance. Well, I have a question actually. Uh, maybe is is to see and uh, I, I will try. So there is a uh, let's say there is a debate uh, between uh, if if we think that some of us is quite spontaneously participation of city gas uh, in the cell wall, or if there is a genetic mechanism that push uh, the simplification of somata, and this is uh, can be really useful in archaeology also to try to understand what that can be from such uh, And my question is, since <laughs> because of your experience, extending experience on somata, uh, somatal, do you think there can be a reason why Asamata simplified and why it should be blocked? Because by the end, when well, uh, well, uh, everything is blocked, or maybe uh, this is my question: like, do you think that there can be a link? I think there's there's definitely a link that's not yet known. What we have are lots of plant scientists that choose to work on fresh, young, but mature leaves to get leaves at their most physiologically active, to look at photosynthesis, to look at other you know, processes for productivity. But what we know much less about is the aging of the leaf, mm -hmm. senescence of the leaf, and what happens to stomata as they get older. So if you look at uh, beans, for example, and, and, it, and it's the same for many, many of the species, um, it's not just blocking through, through silica, but also through um, kind of occlusion of the stomatal pore by, by uh, kind of cuticular wax and cuticle things as well. Um, so I think that there's a process of maturation that may be to do with preventing pathogens from coming into the leaf as it gets older and, and less able to defend itself, maybe. Um, or it could be things to do with reducing water loss uh, later on. Or it could be, for example, in, in pods of beans, what you have the when the bean, when the bean pod is very young, the stomata are very active. And they're probably playing a big role in carbon fixation from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. When the bean pod is fully expanded, then there's a real need for the seed, which is now starting to mature, to rest, fix all its respired CO2. But the only way you can really keep that CO2 in, I think, might be to reduce the stomatal conductance of the pod evidence. Mm. So again, you get this occlusion of the mature stomata, and that could be a, 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 and a, a thickening of the wax as well, that, that could be to reduce or to stop uh, gas exchange. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Ah, oh, I have to... It's not exactly a question. Uh, it's just that no, I, I really enjoy it because uh, we have a very similar idea for our project, but we started from a different perspective. So we wanted to use uh, abandoned terraces in the Mediterranean because they are higher altitude, many of them, like medium or high mountain terraces. I tried to do something similar, so I thought it was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so, but we started the opposite. So we selected the areas, and then from there we wanted to do something like that. Nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, think with with you know, elevation effects. Exactly, yeah. because yeah. With mm -hmm. climate change. Yeah, it's, it's like <laughs> a, it's like a refuge, yeah. oh, no. but also uh, it's because uh, abandoned terraces have a lot of impact on the environment, erosion, right. rain, uh, how do you say, when there's lots of rain, I can flooding, and, and yeah. yeah. So it's a way to 
reuse them and preserve uh, but impact on the environment here. Yeah. So that's why we were so trying to do something like that. On that note, <laughs> where we've got this uh, here, in the future bean yields, you'll see there are some areas that are actually better mm -hmm. than before. Mm -hmm. And that's because they're high mountain ranges it's that yeah. were previously too cold. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, it's exactly. Right. But with and the climate change, it will be more available. Yeah. 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 yeah, that was the idea that we, we had in mind. So it will be that fun. That's the same thing in all of Europe, right? Yeah. Some places are going to be better. To yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the northern. The northernmost points, the northern hemisphere, they're probably not going to be complaining too much about it. <laughs> but as we're seeing in, in the UK, you know, the flooding, the extreme uh, rain events are, are a big issue. Right. Yeah, we'll done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my question comes, I mean, I, I'm, I'm very ignorant about genetics. I mean, I have a very basic understanding of how it works, but my question is um, on the, if I understood correctly with this fixed model, you start from the location, basically, of where the seeds was collected, and then by analyzing uh, its uh, genetic... No, no, no. So, so oh, the genetic okay. comes much, much better. No, so you, you, you know more or less that Condition, environmental conditions. How do you? So you just use to, you just use it. climate models. Okay. With the three, many many accessions uh -huh. that that have their coordinates, and sometimes these coordinates are rubbish. So it might just be a market. Yeah. Well, yeah, it could be growing anywhere. Yeah. Uh, but that usually you you have to hope that it, it, it's grown close to where it's planted. Um. But this is only a means to, to, to choose accessions that may possess the, the characteristics you're interested in. Okay. So you can draw from that climate model uh -huh. any, any of the parameters. So you might be interested in uh, you know, where it's going to be wettest or where it's going to be driest at a particular time of year, etc. And only then do you get this kind of short list of those accessions that are most likely to have traits you're interested in. Right, okay, okay. But then you order those accessions from the GX, yeah, yeah. grow and them, analyze them um, how you want to. Okay. And do you, and do you most of the time you find the Logical match between yeah. where do they come from and, and the phenotype? More or less. I think it's early, it's too early to say, and this approach is not being used much yet. Because it can grow here and being adapted for a competitive yeah. climate yeah. because it has been. Yeah. And yeah. the other problem yeah. is that yeah. lots of these accessions are land races mm -hmm. for very you know, undomesticated mm -hmm. wild relatives or you know things that probably wouldn't want to grow in the field yet anyway because it's too risky, low yields, etc. Or they're they're highly heterogeneous. Mm -hmm. So it could be you get one accession and then you look at the seeds and there's so many different colours and, and shapes. Mm -hmm. and... So sorry, just a step over again from ignorance. If so, am I correct in understanding that if this, if you find a good correlation between this uh, environmental condition and, and you know the finding of the traits, uh, would it be possible to do the reverse? So if and when we'll be able to uh, extract good DNA from archaeobotanical material normally desiccated rather than chat, because chat has a lot of problems. So we will be able to use that to reconstruct the environmental condition in which the state was I think just to some extent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you because we're getting more and more knowledge of gene function. So you could say that there's this particular genotype or this particular polymorphism that's associated with a particular environment. Okay. I don't think we're there yet, no. <laughs> uh, but there might be some examples where it's possible. Thanks.
Is that really fantastic? You know, lots of problems solved. <laughs> for, for, and so, so, so the, my colleague Rafael Rafael Utica, who, who works on the phone as well as many other parts of the project, he's interested in ancient DNA and extraction of DNA from from yeah. plant material. Uh, but he mainly works on old herbarium right. sheets. Yeah. Uh, so these are you know, 100, 200 yeah. years old. No, yeah, yeah, the DNA extraction from archaeological materials. It's yeah. the whole yeah. mess in itself. So <laughs> it's it's like uh, she played it with, with the yeah. with the title. Uh -huh. it. But uh, it's, it's, it's tried to with ETs for more than two years. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> so at Q, we've got a new clean room dedicated to ancient DNA. So it's yeah, completely filtered air, you've got to wear special suits. <laughs> and imagine it's the same with fibre and starches. <laughs> Well, oh, sorry. No, we can, we can go to. Uh, no, it's just about the, the question of physiology because uh, so on the data I showed on my sketches, I also did the FTIR, the Fourier transform spectroscopy, and there is this uh, wax peak, and actually the peak for wax is perfectly negatively correlated to my bulk silicon concentration. So you have this negative correlation, this crystal clear between. The, the expression of cuticle wax and the silicification. Do you, wow. do you have any idea? Is it a matter of transpiration? That I mean, yeah. my colleagues in the Western Australia they told me that silica could block, uh, block in a way wax. So that's really but, but I know, and I don't know if you have any because we would see that as a basic trade off, but uh, I think that's a bit too easy to see. And maybe it's more of like a physiological mechanism. Yeah, I have no idea. I'd like to know more. I think. Yeah, it's something. Yeah, that's true. And actually, under the microscope, for the species for which you had uh, this clear peak for the wax, you see the wax in the epidermis, you see these wax pixels, uh -huh. very good looking. And uh, for the low silicon species only, and for the high silicon species, they are not here. And you have this silica layer. And just like um, this. It's crystal clear the pattern. Yeah. But you don't uh, have yeah. okay. Anyway, because I need to speak about that with some physiologists because I see these results I'm trying to make this around because I'm not putting my mind. So, yeah. anyway. Well, anyway. it could be divergent strategies for the same. Yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my yeah. initial thought. But... Let's see if there's any questions on that. Uh, so, I don't see any questions online. No, but this one was uh, for. Yeah. Uh, oh, we will talk the last week. Last... Yeah. This, yeah. One, this one was uh, for, for the last talk. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah it was at noon, uh, 12 30. Yeah, 12 30. Yeah. We yeah. haven't uh, asked you. Well, I think that's what we're doing. Yeah, I really think, yeah. I think yeah, it's, that's pretty much to do with okay. the other one. So, uh, well, I will put here yeah. for the camera. <laughs> so, we are done with the talk for the morning. It was really interesting and amazing. So, I thank you to, to, to be here and give all this presentation. Um, so, now we will have the lunch break. Uh, I would we will like uh, yeah uh, uh, two thirty yeah I think we will be able to come back uh, at the uh, at two thirty so I'm gonna um off the screen for a while uh and see you later see you later <laughs> <laughs> thank you um so now it's my turn to 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 present and I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about what uh, I've been doing in the last five years for first my PhD and now uh, my uh, my current laptop. So let me share the screen. I'm hoping that everything well. Uh, so okay, I guess you can see the screen and. Uh, so, 
Well, first of all, thank you all of you to be uh, to be back today after lunch on Friday. <laughs> this is uh, this is already uh, a lot. So as I was saying today, I'm going to present what I've been doing in the last uh, five years, uh, and and basically I was trying to find a way to reconstruct the backwater management for drought resistant crops. Uh, for like the purpose of trying to reconstruct, as I was saying even this morning, the agricultural uh, strategy. So first of all, a little bit of context. So my interest is uh, basically directed to, to quantify and quantify the agricultural practices in China to inform and I think, uh, I would say, uh, an important piece of uh, knowledge uh, on human adaptation. Uh, but what does uh, does a uh, dry land uh, a dry land is? Um, so dry lands are area characterized by a very uh, low aridity index, which means in terms of water availability that uh, there is a very low uh, rainfall but a very high evapotranspiration rate, which means that the lands have little uh, a little amount of water available to grow. And even if this is uh, not so um, considered, uh, drylands today, and they are growing actually faster, occupy over the 40% of, uh, of the herd surface. So uh, they are pretty, uh, uh, pretty common. Um, so, um, so even if in drylands, uh, there is not so much uh, water available uh, for, for agriculture and for growing plants. Actually, uh, dryland are highly multifunctional. And for an example of this multifunctionality is that in the last 10 years, dryland food production has sustained over the 38% of the population. Dryland are also highly uh, biodiversity, bi biodiversal, and uh, and they are also recently uh, known as the uh, the ecosystem with the higher biodiversity in the world, which is really surprising and astonishing. Um, Dryland are not just the land where biodiversity is high, but I would say that they are also the demonstration of the abundance of possibilities of adaptation strategies uh, for agriculture. Okay. And for example, it's possible to find different ways of water management strategies to cultivate, which include, of course, irrigation, death use, so uh, floods, which are the most commonly mined when we think about dry agriculture. But um, it's impressive to see how even in the most arid area and desert, uh, we can find examples of rainfed agriculture, so crops that grow just with the rainfall, the little uh, amount of uh, rainfall uh, available. So once we define all these different possibilities, the question ar arises kind of spontaneously, maybe not. <laughs> So how can we uh, discover evidence of these values agricultural strategy in, in the past? Um, this question uh, 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 brings obviously uh, many problems that we need to face when, uh, when we want to reconstruct the agricultural management in the past. First, uh, we um, First, I have to say that it's really difficult to find indirect proxy of uh, agriculture, especially of rain-fed agriculture, because there's no uh, no structures uh, that are built just to, to, to cultivate. And this is, uh, yeah, for sure, one of the first now. Uh, but also, uh, one of the things that make this uh, uh, question really challenging is is the type of crops in use in dry agriculture. Because since the beginning of crop domestication in dry lands, most of the plants in use for agriculture belong to well, the cereal use for agriculture are C4 crops. And they, uh, they are part of this so-called category of millet, which include not only but mostly Boaceae and Tiberaceae. 
and among the most commonly uh, uh, plant species that we found both in the past and in the present, uh, we have particularly uh, but this category of C4 is really uh, uh, varied. Like, for example, finger billet and vermillet uh, fix carbon uh, differently from uh, sorghum. And the difference in their carbon circle reflects even in their uh, photosynthetic rate and in their transpirational rate and, and all that it is. So the first problem we have with C4 is that um, they are extremely adapted to growth, but at the same time, uh, they are really variable and we don't have so much studies uh, dedicated to investigate what kind of proxy and traces these crops can live um, apart from obviously grains. But even uh, grains and uh, is a topical composition of grains, which is one of the most common and used uh, uh, proxy for uh, agricultural management. Uh, for C4, uh, it's highly activated. So there are some people that say that carbon and nitrogen uh, is a topical composition works to detect the agricultural strategy, and there is other people that say that it's not really effective. And um, last but not the least, uh, when we deal with dry agriculture and C4 crops, we also face some issues related to preservation of the archaeobotanical materials since the C4 sometimes, and a huge category of C4 is even called small millet for, for a reason, um, they produce very little grains that don't tolerate very wide carbonization because also of their size and they are highly affected by topography and consequently they are uh, difficult to find and classify and thus for example correctness. And this is just one of the problems we face uh, uh, with uh, C4 grains. Uh, so, because of all, all of these uh, different uh, reasons, we hypothesize that phytoids may be a possible answer to detect the water availability and the uh, agricultural strategy in uh, a dry agricultural uh, system. And it's because, first, we hypothesize that the key factor that distinguishes dif the different agricultural strategies in Trident is specifically the water available uh, for agriculture. So there's huge differences between a rainfed uh, agricultural system and irrigated system or other groups. And the second reason why we uh, we decided to go for uh, for phytolith is uh, is that basically we know that water availability influence the transpiration rate that even in C4 uh, is modulated accordingly uh, um, and uh, if, since we know that the silicic acid is absorbed and distributed along the crop and the plant to the transpiration rate, while well, we hypothesize that variations in transpiration rate could lead also to variation in the deposit. I know that before they, they said that this image was not <laughs> correct. I'm sorry, <laughs> for the next presentation, I'm going to correct it. Yeah. Um, so, actually, we were not the first, uh, not even the second one. <laughs> we realized that the deposition of phytolith modulates according to water availability. In the past, uh, it was suggested the use of an index which evaluates the difference uh, uh, concentration between the sensitive morphotypes, namely Adam and stomata, that theoretically um, their concentration uh, depends on environmental factor, and the uh, concentration of the fixed morphotypes, so mostly uh, short cells, that accordingly uh, uh, to literature, um, they should be the one deposit at a constant rate uh, in the plant. Uh, but again, this index and this ratio of sensitive to fix uh, morphotypes uh, has 
not impacted on several uh, C4 crops. And as, as I was saying before, we know that C4 crops are really different uh, physiologically. So one of my first questions was like, can we apply this index even in different species that are not, for example, the sorghum? Because sorghum and landresses of sorghum coming from Italy, mainly, um, where the only um, uh, land races tested uh, or C4 tested uh, for this index. And so my question was like, can we apply this index to many C4 uh, species simultaneously? So then we come back uh, to uh, archaeology and maybe try to model uh, this strategy. But most important, even before of uh, trying to ascertain this question, uh, are all the C4 crops equally affected by water availability in the sense of uh, in their biosilica deposition and not the type of deposition? So to answer uh, all these uh, questions, we decided to basically go experimental and we decided to start by cultivating uh, three different species uh, of C4 crops, which uh, were the same I was mentioning before, so fingerling and fingerling and sorghum, which, as I was saying before, are pretty common species in dryland. And for each species, we selected 10 different land races coming from South Asia and uh, Africa. And the idea was trying to explore all the possible taxonomic components of the uh, of Silica accumulation in, in Africa and South Asia, which are basically the area we are mostly interested in study, and also having the possibility to compare both intra and the intra and inter species uh, variability. And to explore the effect of the water variability on the uh, on the factory productions, uh, we decided to subject all these gravity plates to two different water regions that according to our calculation corresponds to a reference scenario where crops were highly water stressed and I have all the physiological data we recorded before, like during and after the experiment that proved the heavy uh, water stress position. And uh, so this was the first case scenario that simulated a reference scenario. And then we have the wild water crops that basically simulate a wild related context in there. Um, during all these experiments that we uh, decided to uh, to develop into light meter, we not only tried to keep under control the water availability while the crops were growing uh, in light, as you can see in the in the picture, but we were also uh, deeply interested in trying to measure the transpiration rate to have um, an idea of the amount of water that the plants really use to grow and also to try to connect this transpiration rate to the factory deposition later on. Uh, so after that uh, we extracted the phytolates from different plant parts that include the chaff and different type of leaves so we have mature leaves, leaf already rich senescence and also uh, younger leaves and from these, uh, from these samples, we evaluate both uh, the uh, overall concentration of biosilica deposits, but also the concentration of all the different phosphatides we could uh, classify, the ratio, the, 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 also the, I also tried to be uh, the silica skeleton by number. We measure many of the phosphatides and we even uh, evaluate the uh, the silicon and oxygen factory uh, uh, composition. So, um, uh, I don't think I will have time to talk about morphometry and silicon composition of factory in this presentation, but I want just to give you the idea of all the different aspects that we try to connect with water availability in, in these three different uh, species. So let's go to, to the results uh, we collected. Uh, so the first thing that was evident from the real beginning was the fact that both biosilica and phytolite concentration that were, were actually uh, 
related to each other. So for the discussion we had before between phytoliths and 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 biosphere deposits plant. The first thing we could um, see was a high variability both among species but also analyzing the different plant races uh, separately. Uh, we also see that uh, there was a huge uh, intra-species variability, both in terms of amount of biosilica deposits and uh, the relation these land races had with transpiration. And we put aside that uh, since we are pretty sure first, uh, we know that all these crops, for example, the one plotted in this slide, comes from the, the same experimental season, so same soils, same water, same spots, same, same environment, the other things that change between the replicas was the amount of water. Um, so we hypothesize that, in our opinion, some genetics need to be involved, maybe in adaptation to different environments, because the difference between the species and the difference between the land races was that they were different plant races, actually. Um, after that, we also tried to plot all the physiological parameters uh, collected during the experiment with the uh, silica percentage extracted by uh, each crop. And uh, we realized that uh, high uh, biosilica accumulation uh, was actually associated with plants uh, with a high particle biomass, so plants that produce a lot of seeds, and, uh, and plants that have an early flowering time. So I think um, this is one of the kind of the results that demonstrate how uh, results like this one can even cross the discipline and be useful in fields that are not uh, strictly related to the time of the month, let's say. But I, I won't be long explaining this. Uh, and after that, also, as I was saying before, we were trying to quantify uh, uh, the concentration of all the different phototypes uh, we uh, classified in this uh, species. Um, well, this is just an example of two different types of uh, morphotypes uh, that uh, we uh, Evaluate, and the first thing we realized that were uh, actually evident that concentration of cytolites uh, of specific morphotypes are were actually dependent on the water availability, but um, and also depending on the species and on the plants that we uh, we analyze. But most important, we realized that the, the morphotypes that modulate. Their, uh, their concentration in relation to water availability were not just the sensitive morphotypes, so the alligates and the stomata, but most of them were actually the ones that we usually consider fixed. And morphotypes that we usually consider, like the, as I was saying before, the positive and the concentrate, but what we, we, you can see in this uh, slide. Uh, show that, for example, the production of polyloids were modulated in permillet according to water availability. And we also show that uh, some of morphotypes, some morphotypes like, for example, the acute cold water, so the trichomes, change their concentration in relation to water availability. That, uh, and usually, these kind of morphotypes are not associated at all with uh, good water, uh, water availability. And uh, the fact is that if we look at literature, particularly in study dedicated to uh, biosilica deposition for regenerating crops, and here uh, are some uh, examples, uh, we actually see that uh, there is the possibility that even short cells of grasses can play a role in response to water stress. For example, I here put a citation of Meunier and colleagues. 2017, where he hypothesized that actually short cells uh, can help to harden externally the veins to keep uh, the water supply running in limited water condition when usually the vessels tend to lose fertility because of the 
of the water sex. So it, it actually makes sense that even short cells modulate their uh, production in relation to water availability. And I would say that the same can be said also for acute pulvosus. Uh, that is not even usually considered consider either as fixed or sensitive, but it makes sense that uh, his concentra its concentration rise in condition of, uh, of water stress. And uh, as I was saying before, this is just a brief example, but we, uh, we detect uh, variations in many different fixed uh, morphotypes in relation to water availability. And, um, and because of this, so because of the huge variability we saw among land races and uh, species, and because we saw that even fixed uh, morphotypes were modulating their um, abundance in relation to water availability, we decided to um, to test uh, the all assemblage, including all the species, all the plants, but simultaneously to see if it was possible to actually predict the uh, water availability to this uh, huge uh, data set. And we decided not to use the ratio I was talking before because for obvious reason we thought that it was really working uh, in this case. And we decided to choose a, a different algorithm which is actually a very easy algorithm to apply to any data set. And so we made the prediction uh, using the complete data set and all the uh, and all the morphotypes uh, all together. And this is just a summary of the result. And I also try to summarize which are like the, the most important, I would say, point that the, this result uh, highlights. Uh, first of all, that not all, as I was saying before, not all the sensitive morphotypes are actually predictive of the water reading. So maybe they are predictive of other environmental uh, phenomena, but in our case, we're not really useful for, for prediction of watering. That some predictive sensitive morphotypes are actually more predictive than others. So, for example, we, uh, we discovered that uniform problems are actually really very good in the prediction. And before I, I said that I wasn't saying anything about isotopes and metrics, but actually, uniform problems are really very good uh, indicators of water availability, even for silicon and oxygen composition and performance. So, we should have a deep look into this, uh, this type of prototype. As I was saying before, we also realized that some fixed morphotypes are also uh, predictive uh, of the watering. And last but not the least, uh, another thing that was kind of surprising for us was realizing that high concentration, as you uh, also uh, saw before in the other slide, high concentration of uh, even sensitive morphotypes are not uh, necessarily associated with uh, water abundance. So it, it's not that more water, more phytolith deposits, but sometimes it happens that more water is associated with a higher visibility of the crops having grown in water stratification. Um, so this is a kind of um, yeah summary uh, of uh, the reasoning uh, we uh, I, I did uh, at the end of all these. Uh, Results. So basically, we highlight that uh, uh, biosilicon deposition is a highly inter uh, species specific, and we hypothesize that there could be a certain connection, like between, uh, yeah, for sure, this uh, biosilicon deposition is even uh, modulated by uh, the environmental context and possibly the water availability. And also because of all these results I have just uh, explained, uh, I also um, suggest that a revision of what we consider sensitive and fixed morphotypes should be would be really uh, great. Also because um, even if one we talk, think about 
genetically programmed silica deposition, there's a high likelihood that it's stimulated by water transportation and that like that the uh, and the ability to the, the genetically ab ability of plants of respond to drought is somehow dependent with uh, their ability to deposit genetically controlled water plants. So last but not the least, and I will be really, really quick because I know that I'm talking a lot. Uh, I didn't forget my uh, first question that was how we can um, go back to archaeology and predict the water strategy in archaeology of dryland. So we took the model, uh, we elaborated using uh, all the all the three species considered simultaneously and all the morphotypes considered simultaneously and we applied it to different uh, archaeological sites. Uh, for example, in this case, we applied it to four different uh, sites uh, belonging to the Indus-like civilization and we did an video about period, so they are all um, more or less of the same uh, period. And this model uh, based on phytolins allowed us to open some interpretive hypotheses on the agricultural system because, as you can see, all the, sam the phytolin samples we have apparently were of C4 apparently were coming from uh, plants that grown uh, raisins, which, which is a great thing of uh, archaeology. And we applied the same model also to uh, different uh, two different sites, uh, dated pre acoustic and acoustic uh, kingdom period in uh, Ethiopia. And again, uh, the phytolith model demonstrates that the crops were probably grown brain fed, uh, extensive brain fed, which is, which is uh, a very good data. But the, the very good thing of this study that we conducted uh, also in collaboration with Dr. Uh, Abarbitz Giral is that the model based on phytolith was verified by another model that was elaborated by Abel based on the processing of ethnographic data. And the two models were trying to predict the water availability and the agricultural strategy uh, based on different and independent proxy, but they both seem to indicate that in this uh, archaeological site, plants were grown uh, extensive benefit. So the good thing is that it's not only that this model is really high, really applicable to different contexts because of yeah, all the languages it's protected, but also that it seems that it's working and, uh, and because artists have been validated by independent uh, independent. Uh, so, yes, thank you uh, for the attention at this time on Friday, <laughs> and also thanks to all the institutions and uh, all the people that worked with me in the last five years and uh, offered me the possibility of talking about my <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, not quite. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay, ah, thank you. <laughs> I don't know if there's some question. Yeah, I was wondering like, if you can repeat the relationship between the water availability uh, between the reform. Well, it works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, uh, the first thing we notice is that uh, speaking about concentration of uniform of uniform phytoids, not uniform as we Yeah. Um, deposit in the in the three different species. Basically, uniform is the best morphotypes that works for all the three species. So, yeah. is the morphotypes that in all the three species are. I would say in almost all the land races really uh, change its concentration in relation to the survival. Then we we also decided to measure the bully farms. Okay, so now it's <laughs> uh, the, the spoiler. So we, we took this kind of measurements on the bully farm uh, flavelate. Yeah. 
and basically both the length and the width of the waveforms is uh, changed accordingly to, to the transpiration rate and the water mobility. And by the end, we must secure the uh, the topical composition, silicon is topical composition, and apparently is the best uh, more time we've tested so far. Uh, and even the topical compositions of uh, polypers change in relation to water availability. So it's really, I would say, the best morphotypes we yeah. can observe to, to, to the purpose. Yeah, so, so are you using the concentration of the person A? You, you, you we are using both. Yeah. So we are using the concentration, which are, in our case, because we are working on water crops, yeah. um, they are pretty much related, like, uh, related, yeah. because I, I try to do both. Uh, we are basically using concentration for most of the reasoning about um, physiology, but we are to percentage when comparing to our logic uh, yeah. Because the way we calculate concentration, which is basically the ratio between the by the, the, the morphotypes we mentioned and the dry graph of yeah. the two. Yeah. And the way in archaeology we calculate the concentration of five bits in the sediment is really yeah. it's not compared to like the percentage in relation to the to the to the slide, to the yeah to the to the dance. Yeah, because I work with a pit current during like the uh, building form uh, factories is quite like showing the same case with the geochemical reconstruction to I mean to the ST mass to, to mm -hmm. quantify the, the water availability of the pit band because we thought there's some stage it, it was dried out that the water will be increased. So yeah, we found it's quite reliable, but we are not sure. So you give the answer. So that's the reason why I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm not sure yeah. either because as I was saying before, we saw such a high variation among blood bases, for example, yeah. of the same species, yeah. that I won't say that we is working for all the blood bases of all the species. Yeah. And what I can, can, I can say is that in crops, from, yeah, from at least. Uh, South Asia and uh, Africa, well, crops, yeah. so from Vermilion, a Vermilion, Vermilion coming from yeah. this area, actually, polyphon can be an indicator. As of a, water. Of water. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of water. Yeah, 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 yeah it yeah. happened to me. I'm in the same plan. I, I look at it in next to water and I find many uniforms. I look at the same plan outside the water and don't see many uniforms. Yeah. It makes sense, but I won't say a word about other different types of okay. ecosystems yeah. or species because, yeah, I think one of the data I'm most proud of, <laughs> should I say like this, is try to uh, highlight that even if we, when we work with modern material and yeah. reference material, yeah. we highlight high variation. So oh, yeah. there, there's something that is completing this. Uh, Variation in price. I think. Yeah. With, have you thought about, apologies if you've already mentioned, have you thought about a multi location trials with yes. those same sets of, of land races? Yes, we, we, we did. <laughs> Uh, ah. So this uh, we try to to do the experiments in uh, basically the same experiments uh, under the same circumstances with the same species and races. Well, at the University of Bavaria, we didn't have enough space to test all the drug races, but we have like a, a reduced number of them. And so, yes, our idea was uh, initially to try to see what happened when we cultivate like the same thing in different spaces. And we are still working on these samples coming from the UPS. But the idea is the same. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe some results are coming. <laughs> <laughs> and also at the UPS, because we were in a 
uh, weather context, we want to try some C3 cultivation. So, what, so some C3 cultivation, see if something happened uh, in the process. Yes. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe go to the bathroom. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 Um, so yeah, one of the one of the nice things that uh, that came out uh, from all these experiments, uh, and I think uh, you know, especially from an archaeological from, from the point of view of an archaeologist who's not you know uh, who's dealing a little bit with plant physiology, but not plant physiologists, right? So we tend to think of these plants as well water and water stressed, right? Yeah. But then when you actually look at the physiological parameters and at the isotopic composition, the water stressed are not stressed at all, like nothing. You know, the water stressed plants produce, like, I think, more biomass in, in general terms than know. the well water. I mean, they produce less seeds, right? But they produce more, more biomass, which, you know, if you, if you think about it, it's like sort of counterintuitive. Um, so I think that, the, and so we kept calling them, you know, water stress, because that's how we started the experiment, mm -hmm. and we just keep, keep going with the same thing. But, but actually, I, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, you know, this concept of what, what we consider water stress, because uh, um, I think that these, these species are adapted to less water. So, you know, it, it's not, uh, you know, the, the, the concept of water stress, it doesn't apply the same as, you know, when you're talking about other species. Like, I mean, you've, Francesca has shown you the pictures, like uh, the, per, the, the permillet that we first saw, uh, and that was what started all this. It's grown in the middle of the desert, like on a completely sandy soil, almost no organic matter, like we, we did the analysis, there's very low, low content of organic matter, uh, no water whatsoever, apart from the rain. And, and here is like about 150 milliliters of water per year, which, you know, and they are, and they are, and they are, they are highly intensive plants. They are not, they are not suffering. And they are, no, no, also because they are pretty, yeah, no, and the, the roots are like, like this. And I think that's, a, yes, and I think that's the point, because I think uh, that something that we want to test is that they use the, the little bit of moisture that accumulates by the tree. In oh, the yeah, very yeah. top soil. That's yeah. That's I think that's the, that's the the thing. But you know, uh, it's a little bit. Uh, I think this connects really well with what you were saying at the beginning. We are cultivating the wrong plants for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. in the wrong area. So these people. Uh, so the the we went. I think the first time in two thousand and sixteen. And then when we went back in 2019, in the same area, the, there were like companies that were trying to implant uh, citric uh, cultivations using like tap water. So tapping, yeah. so sorry, using right. the ground, ground water, so tapping into ground water, which we all know is going, you know, it's like a disastrous consequences. Uh, instead of keeping, you know, keep, keep up with the sort of traditional way of calculating. And I think that's because if you look at these type of fields from like, a, a, you know, from what we are used to seeing, you think they're very, you know, very good production, lots of labor investments, you know, because the plants have to be very safe, because obviously they have to, you know, each plant has to be able to yeah, grab whatever they can. But the, 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 the farmers we were talking uh, with, they were saying that uh, 
in, in this way, they can calculate uh, um, like enough to feed their family with half of the harvest and half they sell it to the market. So, you know, it's not like, it, it, it's a potentially very successful way of doing things and it's disappearing because, you know, it's... Uh, it's uh, and, I, and another thing I want to add to this is that most of these land bases are not only high silica later, but they are also the land bases we saw that they emulate their biosilica deposition uh, according to water and they are pretty efficient. So one thing I was recently talking with Tala and many other like people that are interested in bioagriculture is that why we never think about giving more silicon as a possible fertilizer because we actually see that it's efficient. The plants with more silica, the plants resist better to water stress, which is something we are really interested in. And especially biosilica, it, it's a green fertilizer. It's not affecting uh, the soil so much. So it can be also a cheap and green alternative. And so yeah, yeah. So we really should have a look on this kind of. <laughs> Do you know the soil and mineral nutrients factor and agriculture because some soils uh, soils Do you know the type of mineral you have in soil? No, we have no, we haven't done mineral mineral studies, but uh, uh, we we did some elemental analysis of soil. Yeah, uh, but not mineral. So so silicon might be if you have like young. It was fresh primary minerals, you could make it that cool and adding more on changes. I don't know. This is a thing I was thinking, but then I also saw that there is a lot of discussion about what kind of seed the plants can uptake. Because we know that the plant is just simply uptaking one specific uh, molecule yeah. hydrated. So, yeah, this is maybe a thing we should check. Yeah. Going back to your point about the water deficit not being a threat, there are two things. One is that if you if you intentionally give less water to the plant, that stress memory will make them much better at coping. But if you give them plenty of water and keep them happy, and then suddenly there's a water deficit, you know, drought episode, that yeah, yeah, that's, it's going to suffer. Yeah. 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 Um, so I guess that, that these plants are both adapted genetically, but also adapted from germination onwards. Yeah. 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 And I think the, the work of it's Ian Dodd. Uh, has done the ABA experiments where he's, he's showing that you know, if you just just keep these you know, tomato plants or whatever, just with, withdraw enough water to keep them ticking over, that will make them very yeah. resistant. Yeah, and for that is reason, yeah. we also did different experiments. I didn't talk about, but we also tried to to impose water stress in different moments and for mm. different periods yeah, of time. The yeah. type of water stress experiments is a big thing in literature. You, you yeah. can just reduce the, the, the amount of water that we need the same day at the control. Yeah. But you can also really apply a long drought. And that has no stress, I guess. Yeah. So and how, one, how we do it? Uh, one thing we realized that the plants really don't, they are not bothered by the amount of water, but in the moment when you start with your water stress. Yeah. Uh, uh, so yes. <laughs> just like the beans in there, you know, droughting and flowering time, it's probably yeah. set yeah. super sensitive. Yeah, but, but coming back to what, what you were saying, I think that uh, uh, one thing that this experiment shows that goes exactly in the you know, same line you were saying, is that we use lunges so we use plants that are probably very well that that being kept, uh, you know, uh, say 
always want to stress in a sense, or always want the benefit. So, and that's one thing that we had to fight a little bit with a colleague from ICRISA because they didn't want us to look like this. They wanted us to look like other, you yeah. know, because they, they kept saying that, you know, the, nothing is going to grow with your, with your experience. It's like the, the, the Milpa experiment mm -hmm. in, in Mexico, in the, in the uh, Sonoran Desert. We did this kind of multi location with their land race. They you know, grow every year and the elite varieties side by side. And it's not straightforward. Yeah, which yeah, yeah. Yeah. Works. Exactly. yeah. Sometimes well, it's the land race, sometimes. Yeah. 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 But yes, yeah. that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Like was it the first time we saw that? Like, so large. Yeah, it's uh, they they go up to like a like like one one. Yeah. And every city is used to keep them straight. You know, mm -hmm. All these species very very long leaves. Exactly. I don't know if you have tried. You have tried to keep some seed. Right. No, 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 I didn't have to design a lot. Yeah, yeah. And I even covered the soil. To be sure that all the water I was calculating was captured. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, 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 and so, yeah, so, yeah. so and they were inside like the meters, so this was not uh, so much uh, moving around of that uh, element and thing. But this is a thing I, I would like to try to see what happened if we change the. Yeah, now is the moment to change soil. We <laughs> can change the yeah, the water, and not, now I, I would love to try to change. So I yeah, see what happened. Actually, I'm really pretty positive that something is going to happen even for like twice. Uh, as I was saying before, I think if we go deep into try to uh, untangle what five D are useful for, but <laughs> there should be a reason why plants deposit acidic ice. Yeah. <laughs> why? 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 But yeah, and again, I think another another result that's been that's been coming out from all the talks from Nanan to the very last is that you know you need models, you need re you need reference, you need models based on you know the area where you're working, and uh, you know I think we're not there yet. We're not at the point yet where we can extrapolate results on the. Uh, you know, global scale or, or bigger scale. Well, fortunately, so we have more work to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we touched on us four. So, <laughs> I think we can uh, close if there's no other no yeah. question. I think we well, can. And okay, so thank you everybody to participate today. And we are happy to have to have had this opportunity. Uh both to put together this this panel and to listen to these very interesting uh thoughts and also to to have the opportunity to talk a little bit more about my beloved cycling. <laughs> <You're such laughs> <a man. laughs> exactly. Uh and I hope to see you. Soon around at congresses, field works, and yeah. <laughs> and have a nice weekend for everybody. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.